It's time for Mac Break Weekly. We've got a great show, a great panel. Adam Christensen from MacCast is here. Mike Elgin is here as well, as long as uh, as well as uh, Alex Lindsay. And we're going to talk to Mike. We're going to have we're going to have a Mike. You got some explaining to do. He says you shouldn't buy the iPhone 4s. Wait for the iPhone 5. We'll find out why next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This. Is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 271, recorded November 1st, 2011. The Sacred Fire Pit. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by GoToMeeting with high-definition group video conferencing. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com and use the offer code MACBREAK. And by Ford, featuring voice-activated Sync App Link. Now you can control select smartphone apps with your voice, so you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Check it out in the 2012 Ford Fiesta and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Audible.com. Download the free audiobook of your choice at audible.com slash MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, ready to cover our Macintosh needs. iPhone 2, after all. Let's start. Uh, we got to, you know, Andy's on the road. He's out of here. He's, he's, a, he's in the air. He's in a plane. He's not There's even no in the road. excuse at all. Yes, exactly. He should have been flying Virgin America where he can enjoy a fast internet connection could he do a show uh from uh, virgin america you think no i, uh, no. I don't no, think so no streaming's bad on the yeah. it is it's really funny <laughs> you can download well, you know what's funny is youtube is really good on virgin america oh they probably have their yeah own. They, they they're doing some each kind of plane has a local shaping. youtube cache yeah that's alex Lindsay from the pixel core pixelcore.com for the multimedia artists guild learning working living and breathing together and pixelcore.tv for the podcast every Thursday at pixelcore.com slash live. Another great live event. You've been doing so many just down the hall. Yes, we're doing uh, Gear Media Tech this, uh, this Thursday. He's in so the Twit Brickhouse uh, adjunct. Yes. What we need a name for it. The, uh, what do they call it in the church where they, uh, <laughs> the rectory. He's in the rectory. <laughs> That sounds really, that doesn't sound right at that all. That doesn't does sound it? good at all. I don't know if I want to be in the rectory. And now Alex Lindsay from the rectory. <laughs> to, to Alex's right, Adam Christensen of the MacCast, MacCast.com. Hey, Adam. Hey, how you doing? Great to see you. Yeah, my first time virtually in the new studio. I was there, uh, what, last month? Yeah, so in I person. love it. We, you know, we try to get people to do it live, but you see we're in the middle of nowhere, and so not everybody's here. But Skype, thank goodness, still works, even though Microsoft now owns them. We were talking. Yeah. We were talking about the fact that Skype probably will never, on Linux anyway, will never get past its current version, right? I mean, which might be a good thing because maybe the current version Mac. has not necessarily been an improvement. I know, not on the Mac it hasn't. And then to my left, hey, it's great to see Mike Elgin. Hey, Leo. I, I almost want to say of Google Plus fame. <laughs> That's right. He's 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 the, he's the he's the guy. He's the guy who's promoting Google Plus to its 40 million users. Mike, of course, uh, writes for Computer World and has his own great newsletter, which is free at Elgin.com. Actually, I shouldn't point people to Elgin.com. Just go to Google+. Plus. Sure, go ahead, because it, uh, the Elgin.com now redirects right to my Google Plus profile. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. Problem solved. Why do a blog when you could just do this? Um, great to see you once again, Mike. Thanks for coming back. I, you know, we, we've had you on Twit multiple times. I didn't realize you were a, a Mac fan. Yes. Uh, actually, it's fairly recent. Um, I spent the 90s as the editor of Windows Magazine, so Ooh. I've been on the other side of the brigades. Um, we love winning but, over converts like that. Well, you know, I, I wrote a, a Cult of Mac piece about how I was lured in. And, of course, it started with the iPod. And once you got that yeah. gateway drug, you're, you yeah. might as well just go straight to the methadone clinic. You know, it's so great. Of course, I know we're all reading, and some of us maybe have finished the Steve Jobs biography. Anybody finish it yet? No. <laughs> it's pretty it's long. long. I'm almost done. I'm I should up. have done the audiobook thing. I am. I'm doing the audiobook, so I listen everywhere, and I'm almost, I'm very close to done. But you know, it's been great, and this is why you should read it, uh, Alex, especially. I'm listening to anybody it. Anybody who, and you too, Adam, anybody who's been covering Apple during this period, it kind of, it, you read it and you go, oh, they did know that, or oh, there was. So there's, uh, they talked about the move to Intel and how no one on the board, on the Apple board, no one on the Apple board wanted them to move to Intel. 
because uh, I, I remember I was I was saying if Apple does this, they're nuts. It's crazy. It's what are they doing? The, there's the future is in Power PC. Not so bright, but anyway, I, you know, and uh, at least I feel a little vindicated. The board was agreeing with me, right? But Steve Jobs <laughs> said, "No, we're going to do it," and that's that. And of course, Steve was uh, an iron, ruled with an iron fist at Apple in those last uh, 15 years. But the reason I, I bring that up is they knew very well the value of the iPod in moving people to the Apple. They talk about it all the time, the halo effect, which we kind of pre yeah. you know, supposed. But this was a, almost a concerted effort on Apple's part. It, there was a debate over whether to move iTunes to Windows. Steve did not want to do that. Um, yeah. And there's a very famous uh, uh, statement at the All Things D conference where he said uh, putting iTunes on Windows was like giving ice water to people trapped in hell. <laughs> Bill Gates. My own, view, my own view is that it's like giving boiling water to people in hell because iTunes for Windows is awful. Yeah, I know. A, every time a, they say that, I go, "You guys don't." Yeah. Look, uh, Steve was saying, "Oh, finally, look at some good software." No, oh, it's awful. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. It just doesn't work in Windows with the Windows mentality. It's better on the Mac, but even though it's nearly identical uh, in functionality, but it's just something about it just doesn't work on the Windows platform. He said that in an interview the day that he was going to go on stage with Bill Gates at All Things D. And uh, Bill was not happy, of course. And uh, they go, and they're in backstage, and um, Gates is, like, frowning. And uh, Steve had just picked up a bottle of water from the ice, the, the ice bucket. <laughs> he looks at him, he kind of half smiles and gives him the bottle of water, and Gates <laughs> breaks up, and, that's, and that breaks the tension. So. <laughs> they're, you know, they're, they're talking a little bit about, Bill's talking a little bit about... Uh, um, you know, some of the negative things that uh, Steve uh, says about him in the uh, book. And he says, you know, I, I don't hold, I don't, what did, he, what did he say? There was, it was just yesterday. I don't hold it against him. We had our ups and downs, but ultimately we were colleagues. And they do talk about in the book how uh, Gates came to visit him in his final months or maybe even final days. And they talked for a long time, reminisced. They were pioneers together, and I think they had much more in common. They had a natural rivalry. They were the heads of the two biggest companies battling over the desktop. And well, I think, and I think that uh, Jobs, from a creative pr perspective, um, was superior. I think Gates, from a systems perspective, as far as how to get it out there, how to you know work it out in the early days, was was superior to Jobs. And Steve said some horrible things, like you know Bill Gates, but Microsoft just steals everything. <laughs> they never invented anything. But you know what? I think anybody who uh, uh, knew Steve at, for any length of time just kind of accepted that as the territory. At some point, Steve's going to say something horrendous about you. <laughs> it's just going to happen. <laughs> right. And uh, and uh, that's the way it is. I knew a guy at Pixar that had been fired three times. Yeah. And he, there was actually someone I was told that was behind Steve, and Steve would walk out of the room, and he could just go back to work. To work. <laughs> You've not been fired. <laughs> you will never remember. He really, I mean, he, you know, and people would say, pull him aside, say, Steve, you can't be that way. These people are working hard. And he'd say, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, and then we'd just do it again. Um, it, getting a really interesting picture. But I think that this week, the revelation really was Mona Simpson's uh, eulogy. No. Oh. Don't read that one in front I'm gonna of people. I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry. Don't read it in front of people. You really need to do that in a quiet place. Uh, so she is uh, his biological sister. They hadn't met until he was in, they were in their 20s uh, because, of course, he was adopted. Uh, he eventually did find his mother, and by finding his mother, found his birth sister, uh, Mona Simpson, who by then was a novelist writing her first novel. Uh, she talks in the eulogy about... Uh, how she fell in love with Steve, basically. That that uh, I mean, it's it's really a beautiful story, um, and a, um, just a very touching um, reminiscence of Steve, both before, during, and after, and at the end, uh, before and during his illness, and at the end. Um, and then um, I think the thing that really um, is kind of breaks me up is his or his his final uh words not his final moment because uh, he uh he stopped speaking and and, and kind of <coughs> survived the night and died later uh, the next day but his last words well i'll read you the paragraph because it's um i'll try not to cry when i read it i you know i actually i think it's uh not only is it touching but it's kind of insp i don't inspire is inspiring yeah. the right Something's in, Steve's final words hours earlier were monosyllables repeated three times before embarking, because she talks about his uh, uh, passing on as, a, as an embarkation. Before embarking, he'd looked at his sister, Patty, and then for a long time at his children. Anybody with kids at this point starts to choke up a little bit. Uh, then at his life's partner, Lorene, 
And then over their shoulders past them, Steve's final words were, Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And, there, and you know, you want your final words, if you think about it at all, you want your final words to be a coda on your life, maybe. Yeah. Perhaps a little enigmatic. This is, this is, this is better than Rosebud. This is like, yeah. this is, what does he mean? Is he looking mm -hmm. over their shoulders at, at his, where he's going and saying, oh, wow. Cause you know, he was, he, right. he said about half the time he believed and half the time he didn't believe. Right. Maybe he's saying, oh, wow. Oh my God, I see it. Or he's just looking back at his life mm -hmm. and his children and, and, and the, and his family surrounding him and thinking, wow. Yeah, or all of the above. Yeah. Or maybe it's just he's got a pain in, in, in his yeah, back and he's going, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Right. I don't know. I mean, uh, and that's how she ends the eulogy. You know, I mean, it's, boy. I think when you look at the book, when you look at the eulogy, when you look at almost all the things, what you see is someone who, who played full out. <laughs> yes. And, and expected everyone around him to play full out. And mm -hmm. that's the thing that just keeps on every new thing that you roll that that you open up every you know of this onion. What you keep on seeing is someone who's playing full out and expecting everyone around him to do the same thing. You know, I, I wrote a, a a recent cult of Mac item about Jobs and about some of the criticisms that he got about you know he was supposed to be a jerk. He yelled at people. He you know abandoned his daughter. He ripped off Waz. He did all these like uh, unscrupulous things. And it occurred to me, or at least it, uh, uh, I discovered as I was really thinking about all of these uh, stories that have been fleshed out in the book, that there are really two categories of them. There, there's the category of the you know, the incident where he kind of cheated Waz out of a couple hundred bucks earlier. No, no, uh, thousands of dollars. But thousands, yeah. okay. So, um, but it occurred to me that he was 18 or 19. Right. He was a kid. He did that. Yeah. And, and many of the, the, the callous disregard for the feelings of others category of Steve Jobs' uh, behaviors, pretty much almost all of them happened between the age of 16 when he met Waz and... 24, 25, and this is something that, um, you know, young men have a difficulty with empathy oftentimes, uh, and, and, and so that, there's that category, and then there's the other category of yelling people at, at board meetings and calling people out at work and stuff like that, and in that category uh, of, of whatever you want to call them, uh, ethical transgressions or whatever you want to call them, the, you know, in most of those cases, they, they were actually pretty effective uh, a, a pretty effective part of how he got things done. Um, if you look at the stories, like there's one where he came in and screamed at some chip suppliers uh, and called them uh, uh, FDA, I don't know. Oh, yeah, they uh, made T-shirts out of it. You can't say that with yeah. the words, but they, yeah. Yeah, and you think, wow, that's an awful thing to do, to run into a meeting and scream profanities at people. You're freaking, you know what? freaking, what is it? Let's, how, let's, let's bowdlerize it a little bit. Free, freaking. Can you? <laughs> there's nothing to hang on there's to. no way you can every word is bad <laughs> yes uh, but 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 the what what was missed in that story is they made their deadline yeah you know yeah. in it, it his they said they couldn't they said they couldn't and after after labeling them the FDA yeah they 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 did and and so you know it's kind of people talk about the reality distortion field and his ability to persuade and they talk about using emotion in his keynotes and things like that but you know he used all the emotions he used not okay. only inspiration and awe but also fear and and embarrassment and things like that to get things done but the the the, the long-winded uh, uh, point of all of this is that in the end he, he seemed to become much more moral all the way through his life he seems to have been on this journey of of uh, becoming a better person and I just get the feeling in the last five, you know, since he was initially diagnosed, he he became a really cool guy, really cool. I, yeah, he, yeah. Like any great man, he was a mixed bag. <laughs> we know that much. Yeah. Uh, and when you say great with a capital G, you get a really mixed bag. Um, but I, you know, I think there's a lot in the book. The book is fat. It's, I cannot put it down because it is an insight into stuff that we covered from the beginning uh, about what was going on behind the scenes. It was, I think it's a very fair look and everybody who uh, reads it, uh, who knows uh, or knew Steve agrees. It was a very fair book um, in that it, it reflected both his uh, warts and his, uh, and his brilliance. Go ahead, Adam, you were about to say something. Yeah, 
No, I was just going to say, uh, commenting on what Mike was saying, I, I, as I was reading it, I kept thinking about um, the teachers and the bosses and the people in my life who, uh, you know, I kind of felt, especially with teachers in college and stuff like that, the teachers that you had that were the toughest teachers, the ones you hated a lot of times, were really the ones for me that kind of drove me and pushed me forward and got me to do True. better things than I thought I was they capable your of ass. doing. So yeah, there's a little bit of that. It's a it's a fine line, and I think Steve Jobs probably crosses it in some of these stories. But yeah, the other thing about uh, just commenting on sort of how the book was written and the in the observations that I that I was impressed with is I think the author did something like over a hundred interviews with yeah. uh, people in Steve Jobs' life, and forty with Steve Jobs himself. Yeah. And it, it was great to hear that he had free reign. You know, nothing was off limits. He could do whatever he wanted. I think that really comes through in the. Um, variety of the stories. You really get both perspectives and it feels really, really balanced. And that's what I'm really enjoying about yeah. it is it just, it seems really honest and, and forthcoming with, you know, the warts and the great things and everything about his life. So yeah, I'm, I'm totally sucked into it. Hard not to put it, hard to put it down, not to uh, yeah. pick it up every, every, every moment. Are, are they going to be able to make a good movie out of this book? They've what optioned do you think? it. It's a tough, I don't know if you can do the whole yeah. book. I mean, if you look at uh, Pirates of Silicon Valley, they condensed everything to the point where it right. was a caricature right. of reality. Right. And I wonder yeah. if they can really do justice to it. I mean, it's the same, it looks like it's going to be the same people who did the social network. And, I, and I'm afraid they're going to, you know, it's, it's going to end up being a, a little bit of an exaggerated, uh, I don't know, misleading. Actually, uh, Sony, Sony bought it. And, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Dana Brunetti, who produced The Social Network. He did not get it, but there might be some other people from The Social Network involved. You know, Aaron Sorkin, who wrote The Social Network, uh, Steve Jobs asked him to write that famous Stanford commencement speech. And, I, you know, when I heard the when, when I started reading that part of the book, I went, oh, no, he didn't write that. And it turns out Sorkin blew him off and blew him <laughs> off again and again. And finally, Steve said, well, I, I guess I have to write this. And he sat down in an afternoon. And with only feedback from his wife, he wrote that uh, famous address. And I was so relieved to hear that it wasn't ghostwritten because it was so personal. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what made it so amazing. So I'm glad he didn't get Aaron Sorkin to write yeah. it. And I think Aaron Sorkin, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that Steve did not offer him any money. He just said, Aaron, write this for me. And I'm sure Aaron just said, oh, oh yeah, I'll get right on that. And then it was like, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, he called him several times and Aaron said, oh, oh, yeah, I got to, I got to. <laughs> I'll get to you. I'll get to uh, you. Yeah, I'm working on that, Steve. So there I is a doc. Steve Jobs was a better writer than Aaron Sorkin. Maybe. Steve Jobs was a great writer. Yeah. And he's, he's never, I hardly ever see him getting credit for that, but he, he was largely responsible for the to the uh think here's to the crazy ones think different ad yeah that was brilliant writing um did this this the stanford address was brilliant um he's written a lot of some of his letters are really well written so i, I think That's he uh, point, I in, yeah. in another life he would have been a fantastic writer like his sister yeah, I think it's a really good point. I don't think he's getting credit for that. That's absolutely true. So the, we will see a documentary, the uh, kind of rushed out documentary of Steve uh, tomorrow, November 2nd, uh, 10 o'clock Eastern uh, on PBS. Uh, and it will be the first broadcast of an interview he did in 1994 uh, where he details his philosophy uh, from life. There are also interviews of, with uh, his business partners, associates, other tech journalists. Waz will be on it. Walt Mossberg, uh, one of the original founders of Apple, who was bought out a week later, Ron Wayne, uh, will be there. But the main... The Pete, the Pete Best of Apple. The Pete Best of Apple. <laughs> but, it, but unlike Pete Best, Ron quit. He said, I can't take That's this. Right. Ten days into the company, in 1977, he, he, he was, uh, they had brought him in. He was an uh, uh, engineer at Atari. They brought him in because he'd done other startups. And he said, I don't need this. <laughs> You guys. If he had just hung on to his stock, he would have been many times richer than Steve Jobs was. Isn't Thirty-five funny? billion or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, uh, this interview—I don't know how it got made, but never aired. I've uh, done lots of interviews that I didn't. Hear. I guess so. Huh? <laughs> um, he says things. Here's a quote: "You tend to get told that the world is the way." This is in '94, uh, where he'd been forced out of Apple. He was at Pixar and Next. Just to put this in context, was not yet back at Apple. He would go back in three years. You tend to get told that the world is the way it is, but life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is that everything around you that you call life was made up by people no smarter than you. 
<laughs> That's Steve. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. And I have to say that I, I, uh, I talk about this meeting Steve a year later, spending some time with him, and that was the one thing I came away with is that he knew he was smarter than anybody else in the room. <laughs> and so he's really, what he's saying here is, I'm smarter than the people who made this crap up. I can make, I can make, that's why he didn't follow rules. Right. I don't have to have a license plate. I could park in a dis disabled spot. Well, yeah, I, he, followed the, he followed the rules to some degree. The, the issue is, evidently, the, the story is with the, with the no license plate, is that he, had, he got a new car every six months, and you're allowed to drive. Yeah, right. A, it was legal. It was, it was legal. It just wasn't the way, it, you know. By the way, that car, I looked because I said, you know, I'd like to have that uh, SL55 AMG. It's $215,000. Yeah, because it, AMG rebuilds it. Like they, it's a lot more complicated. Yes, it's not a Mercedes. It's, it's an, AMG. an AMG. Well, I mean, it is a Mercedes, but it's the AMG thing. Yeah, it's a whole. It's a separate like. AMG. AMG can add. I don't know what they added to his car, but they can add like bulletproof uh, windows and. But he had to get oil a new one every six hey, months. You know, AMG can add oil slicks for you. Oil slicks like in Spy yeah. Hunter. So if people are press a after, button. You can press a button. Do, 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 do. I think they only do that for government officials, though. And, you know, you might say, somebody's in the chat room said, uh, well, yeah, okay, you can make that self-fulfilling prophecy, just surround yourself with nims, nimwits, dimwits, but I don't think anybody would say that Steve did that. In fact, if anything, he pushed away the people he thought were stupid. Well, he crushed them. He crushed them. And the people, <laughs> pushed them away. The just people them who surrounded him <laughs> were people who would stand up to him, who were smart. Who, I mean, he did not want to be right. around dumb people. Well, they are very, very focused. Bozos, I mean, he called everybody. Bozos. Right? The, the, the one thing, the, I don't know if, I mean, for all, if, I've been in a lot of meetings at, at one infinite loop, and the closer you get to, um, uh, to Steve, the more the more focused, the more clear-headed, the more you know intelligent. I mean, you know, it just it just gets this because that's the only people that survive. You know, if they're in, the more meetings you're in with Steve, you know, the only way to survive is to is to perform. You know, I have been thinking. Very, very, I have been thinking because we've talked a lot about well, what happens to Apple after Steve leaves, and I've really been thinking about this and looking at them all. And I watched the memorial service. We watched a little bit of it last week on the show. And I've, and I've really come to the conclusion, well, Tim Cook is a nice guy, obviously, very competent, very capable, even-tempered guy who could who can run a company. The vision going forward is Johnny Ive, 100%. I and I, and I, but that's the good news, because Johnny and Steve worked really closely together for f 15 years almost. Johnny was there when Steve came back. He was about to leave, and Steve was so wowed him, he said, I'm going to stick around. And according to this book... There was no one could say no to Johnny Ive except Steve Jobs. He was a force in Apple, and I bet you it's still that way. Well, and, and I think I think Ive's vision with with Cook's implementation is a is a pretty that's scary. That's not so bad. It's a pretty scary combination. That's not so bad. So I think that Apple. I have to revise my thoughts. I I really did think Apple didn't have much of a future minus Steve Jobs, but they still they they have Johnny Ive and they have Tim Cook, and maybe the two of them can make one. Steve Jobs. Uh, okay. I know people are people are saying, hi, oh, are we still talking about Steve Jobs? Look, <laughs> there would be no Mac Break Weekly without yeah. Steve Jobs. Yeah, I can right. tell you that right now. There would be no Apple. You know, there'd be nothing to I talk I don't know if about. this network would exist. Yeah. You know? I don't know if I'd want to be doing uh, obsessive conversations about enterprise computing and Windows. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> done that. Hours. Done there. Been there, done that. It's no good, is it, Mike? No. No. no our, our, <laughs> Our, our little uh, question engine here is, is full of discontent, though. About? There's two things. The two big things that have been voted up here so Well, we far. should tell, first of all, people where they can go to do yeah, this. Yeah, you can go. You can go to... Um, we haven't changed the URL. I don't, by the time we actually change it... I don't it, care. You know, Leave it. Pixelcore.force.com slash Pixelcore. Um, <laughs> if you go to that uh, and... Um, this is a Salesforce tool... That, that allows people that to ask use, questions and then vote them up. And yeah, Salesforce can, no longer uses it. Yeah, they use it for their internal stuff. But, we they, um, but we use it a lot. It's, we use it more really than well they use it. Yeah, yeah. We use it more than anyone else in the world. <laughs> um, so anyway, the... Uh, so what you can do here is you can, of course, you can sign in, ask questions, and then vote them up and down. And um, what happens, interestingly enough, is, the, is our viewers are very astute, and they get very, very good at voting the stuff up that they're interested in and pushing everything else out. And so they separate pretty quickly. So here's the, here's the big one, is the demise of the Mac Pro. That's good. the number one. Um, you know, uh, this is from Peter James. Uh, will a possible Mac Pro end-of-life affect we're, your, you as a creative de developer? We're, we're, don't, don't, don't give it away. We're going to get to it. Okay, but that's one, and then uh, somebody wants to know about iTunes Match. We'll but talk about that. Those are the big ones, and then of course the next the next one is the back uh, to the rumor mill. The rumor mill about the maps. <laughs> so. I think that's very interesting. Apple did just acquire a, a new company. We'll talk about that, and we're going to put Mike Elgin on the spot. He says, "I hate the iPhone 4s." Mike, you're going to be the only one at this table, but we'll 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 give you a chance <laughs> <laughs> when we come back. Uh, we're have this is fun. We're going to talk about uh, a lot more.
Mac stuff in just a bit. Will the Mac Pro go away? Wouldn't that be something, huh? <laughs> but first, I want to say hello to our friends at Citrix, the creators of the fantastic go-to meeting now with HD faces. You want to try this out? Go to uh, the website, go to meeting.com. Click that orange Try It Free button and use the offer code MACBREAK. You can try it free for 30 days. Does it work on a Mac? Does it work? Of course it works on a Mac. PC too. And now with the HD faces, oh, baby, you know, you're going to see video of your clients, your customers, your colleagues. They'll see you. It makes, it's not just desktop sharing now. It's video as well. And I'll tell you, you're getting quality that people have been paying for, for, you know, dedicated telepresence stuff, they've been paying tens of thousands of dollars for this kind of thing. And you can do it with your own computer, your laptop. And yes, even your iPad works great on the iPad. So you can attend a meeting on the iPad, see the faces. All you need is an internet connection and a webcam, and you can use HD Faces right now for product reviews and demos, sales presentations, training sessions, weekly status meetings. Do it all from your desk and attend a meeting anywhere. You know, you know when the last time I used GoToMeeting? Not in the John. Tell me not in the John. Uh, no, no, no. Sometime, it was <laughs> earlier this morning. <laughs> it's like every, every morning, every morning. I'm every day you use it. It's just, it's just How can you not time. use yeah, it? All the time. All the time. If you've been using other meeting mm -hmm. software, uh, just do, do me a favor. Try this for 30 days. That's all I ask. Go to meeting.com. Click the uh, Try It Free button, and the offer code is Mac. Break great stuff. I could go on and on about you know 128 bit SSL 24 7 customer support for you and all that stuff. It's very simple to install, you don't need any uh, IT support, it does NAT traversal beautifully. But that we'll leave it at that. Thank you for uh, your support, Citrix. Go to meeting.com, use the offer code MacBreak. So the iPhone 4S comes out today in a bunch more countries. In fact, I think it's now uh, 22 uh, countries. Um, they launched initially in the U.S., Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Japan, and the U.K. Today, they add Austria, Belgium, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Latvia, Liechtenstein, Lithuania, Luxembourg. I just love saying the, the, these names. Mexico, Netherlands, Norway, Singapore, Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, and Switzerland. And uh, already, you know, 4 million in the first three days of availability. Uh, the big three carriers in the U.S., AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint say that fully half of all the phones they're selling are iPhones, all the smartphones that they're selling. Um, it is the fastest selling phone, smartphone, and even perhaps consumer electronics gadget of all time. But Mike Elgin says, wait for the iPhone 5. Is it the battery life that's killing you, Mike? Not there's no one thing about it that um, makes me come to that conclusion. Uh, like you, I love Siri. I yeah. love the both the idea and the promise of Siri. And it kind and of also, works. It it does work. I mean, and works. for me personally, I'm a nut for this kind of thing. I'm mm -hmm. constantly setting alarms. I'm mm -hmm. constantly sending myself or other people messages or email while running or something like that uh, while driving. I don't have my reading glasses when I'm driving or around town. So it's great for that sort of thing. I love Siri, love everything about Siri. And that's why I still use an iPhone 4S is because of Siri. However, um, happiness is the difference between what you expect and what you get. Yeah. And uh, we uh, and I expected and I think we all had the right to expect something uh, different in multiple areas. For, for starters, they actually bragged about the battery life in the in the keynote. Uh, and, and talked about how great the battery life is. And people's mileage varies. Uh, some people are getting great battery life. Uh, other people are getting horrible battery life. I have to charge my iPhone twice a day. Ooh. Uh, and if I don't charge it overnight, it, uh, my alarm doesn't go off in the morning because it, it's dead by the time uh, right. it's time for me to get up. So, and Apple has acknowledged this problem. They're working on it. I'm sure there'll be a fix at some point. But for the time being, <clears throat> battery life is, is an issue. For lots of people, one theory Second, is, and I'm just going to just to, and then I'll let you continue. One theory is that it's in the uh, it's a it's a location services issue. Yeah. That if you go in your, do you have the over the head uh, overhead shot? Eileen, uh, uh, I'm going to get her to punch that up so I can show you. If you go to your uh, settings in the uh, phone and then go to uh, uh, location services right here. <laughs> And then scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see system services. See, that's part of the problem is nobody gets to the bottom. And then they say it, the, one of the issues is setting time zone. 
Now, I have to say, I turn it off anyway, because uh, if you're not traveling, there's no reason for it to check where you are and set the time zone, although I think that's a great feature. I, I like it. But I'm, I'm in a lot yeah. of different time zones. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you would want to leave it on. Now, you could tell what's checking, uh, you know, what's, what's, what has recent, uh, it says a purple location services icon will appear next to an item that is currently using lo your location. So you could tell what's turning on the GPS. The theory behind this being the GPS, and we do know this, uses a lot of battery life. Anytime I've installed on a yep. phone, including an Android phone, anything that checks GPS a lot, that kills the battery. But, you know, I mm -hmm. haven't... I, I'm, I think, Mike, one of the reasons this is such an intransigent problem is that it's not consistent. It's, not, it's hard to reproduce. Right. right. I, I think each phone... I think different phones may have different problems. I've had, I've had well, a lot of trouble with my iPad uh, battery life and not... On as iOS 5? On iOS 5. And not a lot so of people my, complaining about that. My iPads, if I leave them, if I don't plug them in they drain right out and I, since i since i upgraded them uh my iphone 4s not so much yeah know. and they, my wife we installed the ios 5 on my wife's phone and and she immediately had half the battery life but the issue is is really um you, you expect it with i mean apple is so brilliant at delivering i mean the, 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 i think the single most brilliant consumer electronics launch in, of all time was the ipad the original ipad oh, in yeah. april of 2010 oh, yeah. because the first time out of the gate they created a product that was fantastic. Uh, I mean, it, unprecedented. It's a whole new category of product that wasn't full of flaws, problems, bugs, nothing. It was good to go, and it was amazing. And so we kind of have learned to expect that sort of thing. Now, the iPhone 4S is supposed to be, usually what happens, companies come out with a new product, and it has some flaws, and they work on them. And right. then they come out with the updated product, and it's just butter, right? right? Well, this was supposed to be the butter version. This was supposed to be the one that just out of the gate works fantastic. This was supposed to be their Windows 7. Yeah, this their is the Froyo. This was, yeah, exactly. This was yeah. supposed to be the perfected version of the iPhone 4, and yet we're going in, in many of these things that, I, that I'm talking about. It's a step back. What do you What do you think, uh, Adam? Um, you know, I, I'm with Mike on the battery life thing. I've had issues with mine, although turning location services off. The other one that seemed to help is if you're using geofenced <laughs> reminders. Um, that seems to be a problem. Cause well, I love that. So that's a Siri thing you could do where you say, when I leave here, remind me to call my wife. That's right. a great yeah. feature. Yes. Great. great I feature. love they that. The GPS, you know, constant Constantly. GPS pulling. Right. Yeah, well, it's going to kill your battery. Life. So they got to, I mean, yeah. you know, that's the same thing people the, say with Android phones. And by the way, the iPhone 4 still has a better battery life than most Android phones. Mm -hmm. I just want to point that out. Mm -hmm. It's bad yeah. compared to other <laughs> iPhones. Uh, but it's not bad compared to Android phones. It's much more like a, 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 an Android phone. But on Android phones, yeah, you could, same thing. They say, well, turn that off, turn that off, turn that off. And yeah, it gets great battery life. But that we don't want to turn it off. You know what? I just put oh. the Mophie case on here. I have a, just a massive <laughs> secondary battery. He's a much larger phone. <laughs> but it doesn't. One of the best things is not changing the design so I can still use my juice pack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that mean, was the best not, thing. That's not a good thing, right? No. The other thing that Mike pointed out in his piece that, you know, I was really impressed initially with the camera. You know, better 8 megapixel camera. I love the takes camera. Takes great pictures. But I've noticed that I have to be a lot more still with it, it seems, uh, to not get blurry pictures when the lighting gets a little bit low. You, Outside, you, bright sunlight, awesome. Are you using HDR? Um, no, I'm not using HD. Yeah, it, it's the same on both. I, I, I take a lot. There are two places where I take a lot of pictures. Uh, we do CrossFit, and my whole family does it. So sometimes I take pictures of, of, of people doing CrossFit. And the lighting in there is like, you know, 80% or 85% of sunlight. And then I take a lot of pictures in the kitchen when I'm cooking, and that's about 80% sunlight. And if there's any motion on the part of the photographer, which hmm. can happen, or on the part of the subject, it's just a blur. Last night I, I made a pizza and I was taking pictures, action shots of the sauce going in the pan and stuff like that. It's just a blur. Hmm. And, and, and the reason it, I noticed it is that I'm taking the same types of pictures in the same exact locations with the exact same light that I used to t take for a long time on the 4. And those pictures used to come out much better on the 4. I'm wondering if yeah. there's hardware issues, because I don't have that at all. I'm yeah, looking at some pictures I took. I, took I was one. holding this out the window of my car as I drove down a hill, and it's perfect. Well, and, I, and I look at this one. I, I took this at night last night. Like, I, I took this uh, at night. I, I think was, there must be different iPhone yeah. 4Ss. Because I, my, my experience has been, um, <laughs> has been, I have to admit that there's sometimes where I find it more convenient to take out my iPhone 4 than my, than my 5D. You know, just kind of like, oh, it'll actually, you know, it'll, 
I actually like the well, photo more for what I'm doing. Um, you know, not a classic photo, but but and and I've been surprised at the low light performance. Um, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I shot these jack o' lanterns in the middle at, at night in Petaluma last night, and they are perfectly sharp. Yeah, well, the thing well, is, it, it's, it, the, the thing is, is it seems to be inconsistent both on the battery life. Right. Like some days I'll have great battery life, and other exactly. days I don't. Same thing with the photos. Sometimes I'll snap the photos and they look great, but I've had other instances where I've taken a photo, I thought I was perfectly still, and then you zoom into it, and it's you know slightly blurry and i don't i don't know it, why it, i don't know what i'm doing differently it, it makes sense that, that this is happening because there's a larger aperture mm -hmm. and so you know that that's an advantage when you want to as apple said let more light in and get more detail but that's you know that's gonna that's likely to lead to a higher likelihood of of blurry no, pictures. No, that's not Christ. That's no. the opposite. No, it, it, oh, you, it? The, you, larger, you have, the larger aperture means uh, that you, you, you get more, a lot more. You, you'll, you'll have, have a faster shorter, shutter speed. You have a shorter depth oh. of field, but a faster shutter speed. Yeah. So you'll, okay, you know, right, right. So they, I've got it backwards. But I mean, so then it's a bigger mystery. This is shot in my kitchen, and it's probably 20% of daylight. I just went through all my pictures. You know, and, and it's perfectly, you know, it's some great brisket. I, I, ha I have some blur <laughs> when people are moving in a, in a low-light situation, but I don't have, maybe maybe your hand is shakier than mine, because I don't, I haven't had any. Now I'm looking at the Verge. I'll admit that. Are you shaking? <laughs> yeah, the, I have shaking hands. The Verge, <laughs> the Verge published uh, pictures comparing the Galaxy Nexus uh, to the iPhone 4S. Uh, by the way, the Nexus uh, seems to do quite a good job. This is the new Verge, by the way. They launched today. Congratulations to Joshua Topolsky and company. What a site. They've done a great job. This out, out and gadgets and gadget, I might add. Have you seen it yet? I've I'm done, it. Not it to, dis great. To, to, to distract everybody, but uh, it's, it's just amazing what they've done with this. Anyway, well, let, let me show you an example. Okay, uh, good. And and this is like a demonstration. If you go to my Google Plus page, I just reshared a picture I took last night of the pizza making process. And as you can see, uh, when you get to that, um, everything is clear except the part that's moving. So it's not the handshaking. It's, it, it's you see the sauce pouring into the pan. Background, yeah. Yeah, and this was a this was not a dark kitchen. Um, I'm just simply pouring sauce into a pan, and it's yes, yeah. So you, the, the motion blur here from the sauce yes. moving, yeah. The the one thing that I've noticed with mine, and I, this is just a theory, I haven't had a chance to really test it out, but it seems to be pulling the autofocus. Like I'll tap to focus, and then mm -hmm. I get instances where, especially in low light, where it's constantly trying to refocus, and I think it might be also just slightly a timing issue. So the thing with all of these problems that I've been having with the 4S is the good news is it sounds like most of them are probably fixable in software. You know, it's just mm -hmm. tweaking the Including software. Including the battery issues because they, yeah. they don't seem to be consistent, which I think is a good sign. Yeah. The, By the, the way, Mike, is... these are great pictures. <laughs> Thank you. I like the photos. I'm not compl I wouldn't complain. In fact, I don't even mind the fact that the, the sauce is blurred as it's going out of the yeah. pan. We get some sense of motion. I don't think that hurts the picture, but I see what, I understand what you're yeah. saying. Well, the, the point this is, is also I, a I, very I, low light situation. I mean, you're in, you're, it's, it's not a, it's not super low and it's not super high and yeah. but the, the only point is shot. that if I took that picture with an iPhone 4 it wouldn't have been that blur it would have been a li maybe right. a little bit of motion but look blur. at the depth of field on the uh, yeah I love the, the depth of field red. that's a, that I mean it's a fantastic camera otherwise but it's just one of the six things that I found on this phone that that uh, that I personally found is a little bit more annoying I'm throwing away and deleting. A, a higher percentage of my photos because of blur. That's that's the only okay. point I was trying to make there. Yeah, I understand. What? Okay, so that's two. Battery, camera, what else? Okay, so the screen, people are complaining about yellow screens, and I had a very oh, yellow that screen. that happens every time, though, right? Well, but yeah. I, it's not necessarily the case. Now, the, the, the old yellowing used to be splotchy, ah. uh, and it was a glue Right, issue. and as it and dried, as it cured, away. it got better, yeah. Yeah, now this seems to be completely even across the screen it's different for black than a white iphone so we, we have a we have a a white one a black one and we have a you know a couple of iphone 4s around the house so i compared the new 4s white the new 4s black and the old 4 and it's uh the, the 4 looks much better it's it's got really great color the white phone has a little bit of yellowing and the black phone is is noticeably yellow and in terms of like the blues look greenish that, that that's how it, it shows up and so again this is a minor problem this could be correctable with software it could actually be glue we don't know yet I still have yellowing it doesn't seem to be going away yet uh, but but the but again the point is that we went when you have a upgrade of a phone you you especially from a company like Apple you expect the screen to be better right. higher res better color something or at the very least exactly the same but here we went from a screen 
and now we have a inferior screen. Right. Okay. Now that's three things. Um, and again, we you know proof is in the pudding. This many of these things could be resolved one way or another. Now, this is another one that uh, it's difficult to argue about because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But the but some of the Apple's software design decisions uh, are questionable to me. Um, for example, um, they started putting like wood paneling bookshelves. I hate the, that. I hate, I hate it too. Hate I, that stuff. It seems so unapple. Uh, the worst one is uh, find my friends, which is a stitched yeah. leather wallet. It, it looks like a it looks like a wallet that you made in camp summer camp. camp. From, well, camp. That, maybe that's the point. <laughs> well, you know, I it's, but it's you know I can understand the design sensibility. If Microsoft did it, I'd kind of think, well, you know, that's 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 good. But Apple uh, Apple has taste. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a blogger designer guy named James Higg who he, he had a somewhat exaggerated post about this. Right. But he called it, if I can, it's hilarious. There's to a word to for this. It's, what it he said it was saccharine, patronizing, Disney-like, sinister in its mendacity. That's what and I he, liked. He says it lies. It lies. It lies because it's, it's lots of software. Right. And, and, and most importantly, it's, 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 it's discordant with the hardware industrial design, which is not woodshop. It's not it's summer camp. It's... it's uh -oh. Future science fiction. Almost. Oh, we're really we losing. Need to call we're losing. We're going to call you right back, Mike. We're really us losing okay. you. But I think we understood that uh, yeah. what you were saying, and uh, and I thought that was it was a great blog post. Yeah, a classic blog post, over the top. But I think there's something to be said for this. And we've been complaining about it. You know, the fact that iCal has little bits of ripped off pieces of paper. <laughs> you, I liked it when Apple had that kind of grand machinery. Kind of. There's a way to get rid of that. Kind of like really get rid of that? Well, with doing some hacking, oh. you know, <laughs> like or use a different else. program. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think David Sparks told me that he hacked his, you know, using He just it. couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. He went into the resource, you know, into the package contents and like cleaned it up. Oh yeah, you he could said do if, that. if sure. he had that on his desk, you know, the blotter on his desk, he'd be I'd fix it. obsessively ripping that stuff away. <laughs> Skeuomorphic. Right. There's the word ish. Thank you. Skeuomorphic. Uh and it you know, it's I, I just want to underscore something. I think we sometimes think that Apple is 100% and that Steve's taste was 100%. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of examples in the world <laughs> where it wasn't 100%. This is one of them. Yeah. And I don't think that, you know, I think that to some extent it's kind of surprising. But at the other, but you, people make mistakes. And this was just a, this was bad, just bad design. Yeah. Well, here, here, here's the problem that I'm having is, and this has been years coming. There's been little pieces of this going along. But for me, the thing is, is, Apple has always been about consistency, about things being the same. When I move from app to app, things are the same. And now they're playing with these <coughs> these unusual interfaces that are totally changing. And what you lose is that ease of use that we've always had and come to love, that I'm going to open this app and I'm going to know how everything right. works, what every button does, where everything is. And now that's going away. I mean, somebody asked me something as simple as you open up your contacts. It used to say right there on the bottom, in the address book, how many contacts you had when you were viewing all contacts. Somebody said, where is that? It's gone. You have to actually, it's still there, but now you have to scroll the entire list. Right. So if you have a thousand contacts, 1500 contacts, you scroll all the way down and it's there. There are a lot of, ex the bottom. There are a lot of examples of that, Adam. And I think to some mm -hmm. degree that happens over time. You have a right. pure vision. You know, I mean, the original 1984 Mac, I used to, I had the because uh, I wrote software in those days and I had the uh, original Mac user interface guidelines the API books there was a bookshelf right. of that stuff mm -hmm. and it and it was draconian and, and and completely prescriptive and you will do this and you will not do that but as time goes by these things soften and change and mold in fact is some you can give Steve some credit that it, over a period of uh, yeah, what is it uh, 27 years he managed to preserve some uniformity in that right. Mac interface. But I think well, over time I, that stuff goes away. I just, I, 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 th I think it's, it's kind of, uh, it's just, it's, we don't expect it from Apple. Um, right. and, and I have to say, you know, having moved from the Android universe to the iPhone universe, at least for the time being, uh, there are some things, there are some Android user interface features I, I miss. The iPhone, because every app is by a different designer, Every freaking app has a different way to do stuff. There's no, mm -hmm. very little uniformity app to app. There's more, believe it or not, there's more uniformity <laughs> in the Android app space than there is in the Apple app space. 
and yeah. and that's a little shocking. I, I I've come back to Apple to, for the time being, and I'm in apps, and I can't figure out what the hell do I do? You have to press the home button. You yeah, have to press reason, the home button. There was there was a reason there were those guidelines, and yes. I think they were important. I think we're we're moving almost too far in the other direction. I think there's a I think there's a middle ground you can find here where you can still do creative designs and you can do creative things with your apps, <laughs> but there's also some core features like you're saying, like certain buttons and and how maybe toolbars are and and where where items are. You know, I think on the Mac, like now. Developers don't have to conform to where, say, the preferences is. You know, most right. apps have just by default sort of put it under the application menu, but not every app that I have has that. In the old days, it was like, okay, you have it has a, to a be file there. and open, you have yep. an edit, and it's under this menu, and it's there. And and that adds a sense of grounding, I think, to the the user experience. We're that, sounding I like old farts, but I think this is well, not, this is important. important. Yes. Let, let's yeah. let's sound like new farts and look at the. <laughs> to me, what is the the, the most shocking uh, reality that's happened recently, which is that suddenly Google is designing some really nice web services. Gmail, the new Gmail looks great. The You're new kidding, really. Wow. Google Plus. I mean, <laughs> um, these are these are Apple-like in their in their fun form and function unifi unification. And you know these these designs we started talking about the the you know find my friends. Those are designed by Apple. This you know that. Third-party design is a is a separate issue that needs to be addressed. But Apple itself is designing software that's starting to be a little cheesy. And Google, of all companies, is starting to design web interfaces that are pretty elegant. Well, remember, everybody works for everybody. I mean, everybody's moved around a hundred times. Right. And, you know, uh, but well, they're just starting to clean everything up. I mean, that's the big thing with Google is that they're, they're you know they're, they've learned that there's this thing called white space. And yeah. <laughs> you know, it's crazy that if you use it. A little bit here and there, it turns out to be a good thing. Well, there's a great passage in, in, uh, in the Plex, uh, the book about Google uh, by Stephen Levy, where uh, Marissa Mayer is, is quoted as saying that the design sensibility for Google is that we want it to look like a machine designed it, not a human. <laughs> and and, and the, the design, she told it. that to the design department of Google, and they said, oh, finally, now we get it. Make it look like a machine designed it. But... The new designs look like a human designed it. And in fact, the guy who, who designed the Circles editor for Google+, Plus, which is the most elegant interface that I'm aware of that Google has designed, is that the, that uh, project was headed by one of the original designers for the Macintosh. Right, Andy Hertzfeld. Andy Hertzfeld. Yeah. Hertz that's what that's what's so interesting. And John Rubenstein went to WebOS and Palm, and then sank out of the site. So everybody moves around. I mean, Silicon Valley is a, is a constantly in flux. So I'm not surprised that some good people go end up at Google, some people leave Apple, and so forth. Um, anyway, we're this is I, it's a great conversation. Did you hit all of the six? What was it? Seven things you hate about the forest? there are six things, and and there's just a couple more, okay. and these are a little bit more controversial. One is iCloud. Um, if you're, you're if you're a Google user and you're synchronizing through Exchange iCloud can be problematic and difficult, uh, and 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 uh, and the solution to that, as as uh, many of my critics uh, were kind enough to point out to me, uh, is that you know I have to do this, have to do that. But a lot of these things sound very unApple-like in terms of the solution. On other platforms like Windows, oh, the problem is you. The problem is the user. You're not right. doing X Y Z. You're right. not reformatting. You're, you're not wrong. doing other things. Yeah. Right. And and that's the that's the reply we're suddenly getting with yeah. the new iPhone and iCloud. Oh, the problem is the user. You're not smart enough, or right. you're not uh, technical enough to use this product, and that's the problem. It's not the product. And the and the sixth thing is Siri itself. I actually was a serious user of Siri uh, before it was a, a feature and when it was an app, and I figured, wow, they had all this time to work on it. This is going to be amazing. And in fact, I'd been in many arguments with people essentially saying, no, Siri is going to be really, really great. And it is great. There's no question that Siri is great. But it makes a lot more mistakes over simple things than I would have thought. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't recognize uh, what you say, and that's one problem. Another problem is sometimes it recognizes what you say and then does weird things with it. Like, for example, <laughs> I've, I've, I, I've told it to remind me when I get home of X, Y, you know, to recharge my phone. And it said, okay, calling Iris. Yeah. Uh, Iris was a thing I set up to automatically call IFTTT. It, it was in my contacts, but it, it showed me what it understood right. correctly. And it said, oh, I understand that you're saying, remind me when I get home. 
And then the action was something else. So, you know, they said it's beta. That's kind of like nitpicking. I agree. That's, that's probably an unfair one. But I thought it would be better, personally. Well, it's not an unfair one because uh, the real reasons to switch to a 4S are the camera and Siri. Yeah. So if one of those things is kind of only is a little broken, then that's a reasonable thing to bring up. I don't think that that uh, yes, it's in beta, but that doesn't let you off the hook if that's a reason to switch. And your point well, isn't that you don't like the 4S, but that it would be better to wait for the 5 if you haven't yet. If jumped. you're not obsessed with Siri, if you're not like, wow, I've got to have Siri, then no, I would I would recommend that you wait for the 5 because this is uh, if you've got a 4. Now, if you've got a 3G oh, or something you gotta else. you got to upgrade if you got it. got to upgrade, yeah. and this yeah. is this is the one you're going to go upgrade to. And again, I think many of these problems will be solved. The camera in 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 most conditions is far superior and a wonderful camera. And and there's there's much to recommend in the phone. Um, but I just got the feeling that you know it just seems so unApple like to release uh, an up updated version of a major product like the iPhone with so many of these niggling little problems. And I just got the feeling that. They said, you know what, we can't go through an entire year without issuing a, f a phone, without releasing a phone. Because they had to release this, there wouldn't have been any phone in 2011. And, and I, get, I, I get the feeling they said, you know, the phone is unfinished, but you know what, we can throw our unfinished uh, voice recognition mm, uh, intelligent agents in there and everybody will love it anyway. And I think that's what happened. Uh, I mean, if without Siri, imagine this. Well, I mean, it, it would be a, it would have been a disaster. I'll give you the opposing people. argument, which is this is exactly what Apple did with the iPad as well. That their new their new mode is not to make these major upgrades every single time, but to do incremental upgrades. Well, the iPad two was only slightly better than the iPad one. Well, the camera, for instance, nobody would use it. It was terrible. Yeah. I actually yeah. like uh, there's there's a lot of the iPad one that I still I actually like it to be a little thicker. I, I the feel, two the I, two is you know feels, is, is a like marginal improvement. Yeah. Uh, in much the same way, the 4s is a marginal improvement, and I think that we will see an iPad three that will be a more significant improvement, and we'll see an iPad whatever five that will be a more significant improvement. I mm -hmm. have a feeling I'm I don't I I not we we'll, we won't know until the next biography comes out the Tim Cook biography, mm -hmm. but uh, I I have a feeling that. Um, this isn't. This is actually in, in, intentional. Not let's throw something out so we have a phone this year. Well, but I, I think that also. And by the way, I got to point out, it's wildly successful as we as yeah, we said well, when we started. Yeah. And we, so yeah. they didn't make a mistake from a business point of view at all. Well, and I think you also have you have a, a lot of toe dippers, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> there's a lot of people who got the ninety nine dollar version of the, the you know the three G or whatever you know the three GS whatever the, the, the ninety nine dollar version and they said well I'm going to see if I like an iPhone or not and now they've decided okay this is what I want to use and now I now I want to go ahead and upgrade to an to a to the four S uh, and so I think you end up with a lot of conversion you have a handful of people like us that go from the four to the four to the four S I think there's a lot of people out there that are going from three Gs and three GSs to the four you know to the four oh. S I think that's a big source of its success I agree and I, you know for me. It, all I needed was a faster processor, a better camera, and Siri. Those were the three things that, you know, for me, you know, Siri is a huge, like, I, I can't, I can't go back. I can't go back. <laughs> I, I don't care. I don't care if it, it, it barely works, you know, some of the yeah. time. But the thing is, is I am such, I have so many things going on. Me being able to talk to someone and just say, So you put, me put aside that, uh, the Galaxy, uh, uh, I'm still, I, I use it for the camera. I'm, I'm, I'm testing it. Yeah. more than anything else and and I'm but I, it's not even close I, I, I would mean, say it's, it's close to me I mean and no, and that Siri close. was enough just to slightly balance it in favor of the iPhone but I could go back to Android at any moment I feel like I but which is good news there's some real parity on these platforms I, I do think. there are parts of it I like the maps better in on the Android and we're gonna talk like, about those maps in a second yeah but I, I like those better I like the way it interacts better yeah. uh, but there's not much about the Android that I like better than the, the forest Adam what do you think <laughs> I'm, well, I'm an iPhone 4. No, guy. I'm not asking about Android. I think that would be but, foolish. Oh, just dude, in general yeah. on the 4s, you think it's uh, you know enough? Oh yeah, and I, I totally agree with what Alex is saying. I mean, a lot of people I think are moving from a 3GS or a 3G, right. and the iPhone 4s is their first, you know, iPhone 4, and it's that's fabulous. I mean, I remember that upgrade a year ago, and there's enough. There was enough in it for me between Siri and the in the camera and things like that, and all these issues that we're talking about. I really think are software tweaks that can get fixed in terms of the battery life, in terms of some of how the camera's doing its focusing for me, and, and things like that. And I think they're going to be addressed. But you know, to Mike's initial point it's sort of like you as an apple fan or person who follows this you, you expect more out of apple you know you don't expect these little annoyances to be in there and, and they are i mean they are there so we can't ignore them yeah 
Let's uh, let's move along to uh, our next. To Actually, before we move to our next topic, I do want to talk about Apple's latest acquisition and what it might mean for Maps. And we do know, by the way, that Apple has reached out to owners uh, trying to figure out what's going on with a couple of these little bugs. So presumably, there will be fixes uh, to this uh, at some point. Um, but we will talk about the new maps. We will talk about the rumors. We will answer your questions on the, upset, the, uh, yeah, on the Force. What is that Force URL it's, again? It's uh, pixelcord.force.com slash pixelcord. So uh, ask a question there and uh, vote up the questions you want us to answer. You can see how much branding we get out of that, that URL. <laughs> we start and pixel end. Core, pixel core, pixel pixel core, pixel core, pixel core, pixel core, pixel core, pixel core, pixel core. This show uh, brought to you by our friends at Ford. Ford is doing a, we're going to have a great time at a barbecue coming up, and we'll give you details on that. We still, we better get going on that. That's just yeah. a couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> November 13th, we're going to have a barbecue. Ford's going to bring all their newest vehicles. You get to look at them, have some food, watch Twit, watch our new gaming show as it begins its pre-production. It won't be a, a release version. It'll be probably our first rehearsal with our new hosts, Veronica Belmont and Brian Brushwood. Our new show, Game On, begins probably the week after November 20th. If you go to Ford.com slash technology, you can see ahead of time some of the things you'll be seeing at the barbecue, things like the incredible app link. I love this. You know, Ford, uh, Alan Mulally told me this in an interview a couple of months ago. He said, you know, we realize that the smartphones are going to move faster than a car can because the design cycles are shorter. So we have made it possible for your smartphone to interface with your Ford Sync. They call it app link. It's an API for apps so that you can talk to apps in your car. Press the button on your steering wheel. Keep your eyes on the road your hands on the wheel, and say things like, uh, Pandora, play my classic rock station, or bookmark this song, I want to buy it, or thumbs up, thumbs down. Pandora is one of the apps. Uh, Stitcher Smart Radio is already out. Open Beak, which is really cool. It'll read you your tweets. These are available right now on sync-equipped 2011 Ford Fiestas, factory installed in the 2012 Fusion and Mustang, uh, and it works with iPhone, even the 3GS. Uh, Android, of course. BlackBerry as well with the latest BlackBerry OS. I just think this is just one more way Ford is really staying ahead of the pack. Apps that talk to your car, and your car talks back. This is Siri for automobiles. Of course, we talked about how you could tune your, turn your car into a Wi-Fi access spot. There's some neat things, too, for parents. You might be interested in this, Alex. I was. Uh, Ford has, they call it um, MyKey technology. Let me see if I can uh, find this. Is that like, hey, MyKey? Mikey, Mikey will like it. <laughs> when you give your car keys to the teenagers, yours aren't yet, believe me, they will be sooner I than you. I a teenager. Oh, that's right, you do. I forgot, yeah. Well, when you give the car keys to the teenagers, it, using this Mikey technology, it keeps an eye on what they're doing. For instance, you can set a maximum speed, a maximum volume on the audio system. I love this. Uh, <laughs> the uh, low fuel light comes on sooner because we know teenagers will not fill up the tank. <laughs> <laughs> so they, I mean, isn't that funny? That's awesome. At 75 miles too empty, they turn on the low. You need gas. Don't forget, dad's going to be mad. Uh, it's a special ignition key just for your teenager. They can set all these parameters. Just one of many ways Ford is really innovating. Find out about all of them at your local Ford dealer. Take a look at the uh, Fiesta, the new 2011 Fiesta for the um, app link with Ford Sync. And uh, of course, I once took a Fiesta onto our pond. We did donuts. <laughs> and it didn't have a Ford sink. I got a website for you. A new yeah. one? Yeah. Ford.com? TwitBarbecues.com. Oh, wow. We set something up. <laughs> TwitBarbecues. Well, there's, a, there's a banner on our Twit.tv website, but I just clicked on that, and it doesn't go to this, but TwitBarbecues.com. <laughs> Holy it smokes, the first yet. one's coming up on the 13th? Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm saying is what? We who's better doing, get who's going doing the barbecue? Um, Aaron Jonas, our, our caterer, same people who did our uh, nice. opening party. They're great. Nice. They're great. It's going to be delish. So you click on one of these dates. And, and then, then you apply. You apply. Well, that's neat. I wish I'd known that. <laughs> Twit, bar <laughs> Twit barbecue. I just saw an email from Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Yay. Where is the barbecue? We, we've brought the site down, by the way, twitbarbecues.com. Oh, we did? Oh, darn it. Obviously not a Squarespace site. Well, how do you spell that? Maybe I spelled it T -W -I -T -B -A -R -B -E -Q -U -E -S. wrong. T-W-I-T-B-A-R-B-E-Q-U-E-S. Q-U-E-S? No, don't tell me that. Well, that's... B-A-R-B-E-Q? U-E-S. Yeah, there's lots of ways to spell barbecue. Nobody spells barbecue like that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like cut off -y. What the hell? Was, was Twit B -B Wait a minute. That's not... Either spell it with a C or you just do B-B-Q, but there's no barbecue with a Q. 
There are many ways to spell it. I go to a barbecue place here in San Diego, and they have all the different spellings up on the wall, and there's, you know, like 10 or 15 of them. That's actually correct? No. Chat room says it's correct. Yeah. Wow. So the 13th and the Glad they didn't ask me. That's not how I would spell it. Anyway. I, I, the only way I know how to spell barbecue is BBQ. Yeah, BBQ. That's, what I, that's my preferred spelling. Uh, or, I can't or if you're in South that Africa, one. you can just call it a braai, which I, I like. I kind of like braai. Anyway. Go, go. <laughs> barbecue? Wait, it's not B-A-R-B-E-C-U-E-S? Isn't that how it's spelled? Uh, I think that Actually, might be that's one of the spellings. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. I didn't know there were so many different ways to do it. Is it. What is it, a French word or something? It's barbecue. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we're going to have a barbecue. We should have just said picnic and left it at that. Oh, wait a minute. How do you spell picnic? <laughs> so uh, for, for more information, these are the two dates. Now I know. So, yes, it's a December barbecue. Hey, this is California. We can barbecue anytime we want. Maybe in the rain, but we've got to have a big tent. Where, where is it going to be? We, we, we actually got a, the police to block off the street. <sighs> awesome. California's not a very heavily trafficked street. You can, they, we can no, you can't do, we couldn't do the whole street. It's enough of the through street that we couldn't. We have to... Oh, okay. I'm sure right? the grocery store is thrilled. The grocery store across the street is probably... They have their own barbecue. I know. We should have just hired them. Yeah. Well, this is going to be very limited uh, availability, so you really got to go there and uh, request your tickets because uh, we can't... I mean, we can only have 50 or 60 people here. Come. <sighs> Don't come. Oh, d we'll, we'll webcast it. We'll webcast it. We'll, we'll use smell -o vision so you can... So, Calgary Guru says, this is a common misspelling of barbecue. This it, he's he's we are, what are you citing Wikipedia? It, it, it it's misspelled. Anyway, never doubt Leo. I know my spelling. One thing I'm good at is spelling. It's one thing. The Apple Bundle Dictionary. Wait a minute. Now I got to do it. <laughs> what is the? Uh, isn't there a keystroke? Is it command open command shift D or something like that for barbecue for to to spell check something? Uh, I think I just right-click. Apple bundled the Oxford English Dictionary. So you you right-click? Uh, no, yeah, yeah look yeah, up in yeah, dictionary. Yeah. All right, let's see. Let's see. Let's see what the dictionary says. Oh, it comes from a Wikipedia entry. C-U-E. Barbecue, or common spelling variant. Okay. Okay. Or Q U E. There you it's go. not a. It's not a misspelling. It's, it's a, a variant. variant. Yeah. That's what I say about my spelling all the time. The origins of barbecue cooking and the word itself are somewhat obscure. Etymologists believe barbecue derives from the word bara bisu, found in both the languages of the Timucua of Florida and the Taino people of the Caribbean. It's in, it's reasonable. A, yes. And I love my jerk chicken. <laughs> and we're gonna get jerk chicken. And then, in, and of course, in Spanish, I think it's barbacoa. It, stands, it translates as sacred fire pit. See, now, twitsacredfirepit.com, could we, could we have gotten that? That would have been better. Sacred you can't now. Pit. It's just taken. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Johnson spelled it with a C. I just want to point that out. Wow, this is great. This is the Apple... Uh, the, uh, that's good. Okay, let's look at the dictionary here. Let's see what the dictionary... No entries found for barbecue Q with a C. Let's try it with a, with a Q rather. Let's try it. C-U-E. Yeah, see, Apple, Apple says it's spelled with a C. Look at this. Barbecue is often misspelled as barbec. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> it is not accepted in standard English. There we go. Uh-huh. I rest my case. But who wants to be standard? <laughs> Uh, I'm trying. I'm, 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 I read the Steve Jobs books of management. You guys suck. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Anyway, whatever bozos. it is, we're gonna have bozos. <laughs> we're gonna have whatever that is at some point. Uh, did you see the Apple patent for multi touch? Uh, the, patently, uh, what was what is the, the uh, is it patently I Apple? They, I thought they patently they, they patented the. The scroll to it's a scroll. swipe to unlock. Swipe, swipe to unlock is one, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that's a ridiculous patent because that predates Apple in a number of places. <laughs> it's redonkulous. It's redonkulous. But they also just got a, a fairly large uh, patent for multi-touch based on the original iPhone, and these are very these are much more significant than swipe. You might be able to sue on swipe, but uh, Apple has now the patents. They got 14 new patents, by the way. 14 new patents. But they have the multi-touch patents, which is huge. 
huge because there was some, you know, a lot of people said, oh, no, there's a lot of prior art on multi-touch. You can't own multi-touch. Um, this is this is pretty much uh, pretty much going to be a big issue, I think, in future lawsuits. Now let's talk about the swipe. They also want swipe to unlock, which was thrown out in Europe, right, due to prior art. Okay. Has I, there ever been a patent where you think you know, hmm, good patent? <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, the uh, light bulb, I believe. Um, it's been a while. Yeah. Any more thoughts uh, on Apple and television? I thought Nick Bilton had an interesting uh, article uh, in the New York Times. What's really next for Apple and television? Um, of course, we're all referring to this fact that in the biography, Jobs says, I finally cracked it. Some people said it's Siri. Uh, that's what Nick seems to think, that it's voice recognition. And if that's the case, the, the, the remote would have to be the microphone. Because uh, you'd be yes. competing with the sound of the television otherwise. Yes. So uh, that may be it. You just talk into the talk, talk remote. To, talk into the remote. Talk to the remote. And by the way, that could be probably an iPhone, right? Or an iPad. Right. Both of which have microphones. I don't mind that. Now, I'm at, by the way, Microsoft's doing the same thing with Connect and Xbox TV. <laughs> but the Connect is across the room. It's on the TV. <laughs> One of the thought about Apple and the TV, I've I've always, uh, I, you know, I think most of us think that uh, Apple would have done a TV eventually, and and it makes a lot of sense. But I think the biggest reason it makes sense is that it's perfectly in line with their strategy since the late '90s, which has been to uh, obsess over content. Mm -hmm. So their higher yeah. end machines have been optimized for the creation of content. And their mobile devices and other devices have been optimized for the consumption of content. And this is the secret sauce of Apple that people don't seem to understand. If you, if you compare um, Apple, the, the, the iPad versus other tablets, you can see that uh, Apple's uh, whole uh, business is to uh, make tons of money on content. This is, uh, by the way, the Amazon model, so much so that they actually lose money on the device. Uh, but a television, you know, what Apple does is they look around the world and they see where are millions and millions of people struggling with clunky, ugly interfaces for consuming content. And that's why they did the iPhone. That's why they did the iPad uh, and so on. They started with the iPod. Uh, and television is the last great clunky interface uh, for consuming content. You look at, you know, most people, have, you know, most of us are struggling with these cable interfaces where we've got this incredible incredibly complex remote controls given to us by the uh, cable company with these weird menus where you have to, what's on TV and you're scrolling through, you know, a thousand channels. And it's just a horrible mess. Right. And I, I just would love to see Apple come out with the home run, which is essentially an iMac, you know, a 41-inch iMac uh, that you put with your home theater system and you talk into the remote and say, uh, play Dancing with the Stars. Well, the, well they, I mean, I think that it's, yeah, it's, it's for me, the, the, the distinction between the two is Umizumi, which is, you know, I go to Umizumi and my kids are obsessed with Umizumi. What um, is it? I don't know what And it uh, it's some little cartoon <laughs> that drives me crazy. So anyway, so the, uh, but the, uh, the thing is, is that if I, I can't find it in my yep. Comcast, it's in Comcast, it's there and it's somewhere, so I have to go into, I have to go into shows and then I have to go into <laughs> kids and then I have to go to Nickelodeon and then I have to go into preschool for Nickelodeon until I can finally dig my way in to figure out where the Umizumi right. is. On the iPhone, on the, on, on Netflix, I just, you know, Netflix, play on my Umizumi. Apple TV, I just go, I just go search Umizumi and then I play it. You that's know, and, painful and, and, you know, though. That's, yeah. that's a yeah. lot of work. You gotta go. Not on an iPhone. On an iPhone. I oh, just an iPhone in, is quick. You right. know, and, and the thing is, is, and with Siri, is, which is to the point, is if I just said, just play me Umizumi, it goes, which episode? And, you know, episode four, and then we're done. Didn't, um, yeah, this didn't Gruber mention that Jack Donaghy, Donaghy thought of this on uh, 30 Rock? <laughs> that he should have the patent? <laughs> he, I have to see if I can find this. On, uh, yeah, actually, if I play it, then we'll be pulled off YouTube, so forget it. Just <laughs> look it up yourself. And Connect does do this, but the, but uh, with I, with with middling success. I, I still I think that the, I think that the opportunity for Apple is much bigger because I think that eighty percent of the population only needs iOS. I mean I think that there's twenty of us twenty percent of us that are geeks. I can't just have an iOS experience, but I think eighty percent of the United States population could just have iOS. And if you had an iOS in your uh, TV and if they really need to type on it, you could you you could get a Bluetooth keyboard, and all, my kids and my parents would be totally 
done. Happy. All right. Yeah. Totally. Plus, it's an, it's another gateway drug, yeah. like right. the iPod, where yeah. you use it for a year and you pretty, and then it's time to buy a laptop and you're thinking, you know, I really like that Apple TV. Maybe I'll get a, <laughs> you know, a MacBook Air. I just don't even think that they, I don't. I think that what, what's going to happen is people are going to get it on their on their TV. It's going to be totally integrated with the iPad, iPad, and the iPhone. And <laughs> most most of the population doesn't need any more than that um, because they yep. just they're not cre they're not creating anything. They're not doing anything complicated. They're just yep. sur surfing the web and getting their email and and you know it's an appliance for for most people. <clears throat> and 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 in in the case of the iPad or the the Air or a PC or whatever, it's a complicated experience that is constantly got bugs you know rather than just kind of when you click on it it just does what it does yeah all right i'm going to play the video why not aol has it uh, there's many chat room uh, there's the there's like a four-hour merc ad. there's a four-hour merc commercial in front of it which i've been watching god i it's hate really long don't you hate pre-rolls this is a, but this, this is a really this long is a minute long pre-roll i believe okay, all right here we go, here we go. fired here we go this is <laughs> maybe Jeez, Louise. What's the one part of the television experience that's not perfect? To me, it's the remote control. Too easy to lose, right? Yes! I lose my remote all the time. Grr, couch cushions. <laughs> what if you didn't need a remote control? Because your remote control was your own voice. Television on channel NBC. Crew out of the Bronx called the Ace Deuces. Amazing! I give you voice activation. Word for my CIs, he got off by... Well, that shouldn't happen. TV on. He's uh, voice activation he or be. BOAC. The only what we have is some mute kid. Unmute. My <laughs> friends at the DEA say these guys have a high volume of cocaine. Low volume. Low volume. Delete everything that's on my DVD. Oh, why would oh come you on. Aren't six episodes TV on mute. Top God, it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> there you go. There's the problem right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's get to our uh, questions, and you voted them up. Oh, I forgot. I'll get to the map thing before we do that. So Apple, uh, uh, according, well, a couple of things. Gosh, there's, you know, there's so many things to talk about. There's the rumor uh, that Apple wants to do 3D uh, maps, take on Google Maps with 3D mapping. They did acquire a company called C3 Technologies. Uh, that is a 3D mapping company that uh, from Sweden. They bought them a couple of months ago. Uh, it's now uh, thought that um, the 3D maps will be part of a new Apple mapping. And they are app. amazing. The C3 maps. You want to see a little bit of these? This is. Uh, they are insane. They say they're calling it Google Maps on steroids. Here, this is from NetbookNews.com. <clears throat> Oh, no, another ad for Android. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Well, well played, played, sir. Well played. All right. Here we go. Uh, I just want to see the picture. Show me the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apple also bought uh, PlaySpace, which is a Google Maps competitor. Remember that Apple's collecting traffic information. That was one of the revelations with that data uh, Snafu earlier. Yeah, also, Poly9. I think this is their third mapping company acquisition. So, so they're clearly building something. And, you know, it makes sense when you... Oh, look at that. Wow. When you... Um, uh, there, one of the anecdotes in there, which confirms something you'd said all along, uh, Alex, is that Steve goes ballistic when Adobe announces it's not going to release no. Premiere and says we are never again, for the Mac, we are never again going to let a company determine our future. We will write our apps. That's when they decided to write iLife. And I think that that was part of Steve's vision is end to end. And why rely on your hated enemy Google for your mapping app on the iPhone if you could do your own? So I'm sure that this is something that they want to do. And this, it looks yeah. insane. This is, this is, by the way, your defense dollars uh, at work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I Just as Siri was, was, by the way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And the Internet and the GPS system. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I think this, this is very much part of um, Steve Jobs' thermonuclear war. Yes, I think I think if, if, on if Android. Google had never gone uh, take come out with Android, I don't think this would be happening. Well, remember pre-Android, there was this kind of nice relationship. Schmidt was yeah. on the Apple board. There were a number of Google apps on the uh, iPhone. We're Very still cozy. waiting. Uh, Paris, Paris Lemon, uh, MG Siegler says a native Gmail app is imminent on the uh, on the iPhone. But of course, Apple has to approve it. Be interesting. So this is a mapping app. This isn't just vi aerial video. Wow. Yeah, that's what it looks like. That's spectacular. Yeah. 
And, and, the, and, and I will say, Google Earth and a lot of the 3D Google stuff looks really, really great, too. I don't think it looks as good as this. This looks real as opposed to a, a texture map on top of a 3D SketchUp image. Uh, I don't even fact how they know how they could be doing this. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that, uh, you know, I'm 100% I'm certain that we're headed toward a multi-touch desktop world um, right. where everything is like a giant iPad. And this kind of application on a on a big, big, big desktop computer that you're using with multi-touch. Wouldn't that be sweet? Oh, yeah. If you, in fact, if you look at the Pixel, what's the name of that company, Pixel something or other, they're the ones who do the, the multi-touch displays for CNN and so on, uh, Jeff Hahn and those guys. They always show mapping applications like this to demo because they're just such, it's such a wonderful thing to right. manipulate an interface like this through touch. It's a natural, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was like, Candlestick I, I Park on, in the football I noticed myself now doing more of this. Touching like, your yeah. laptop? Like, yeah. Like I'm like thinking about something and then I go touch it. Oh, yeah. I'm the wrong. <laughs> well, it's inevitable. In fact, yeah. you know, uh, Steve did say uh, that nobody wants to reach across and touch their laptop screen except that we all do now because yeah. we've been conditioned to do so. And I think that's an imminent. I don't. Yeah, certainly, uh, Microsoft's doing it. Is, I would say most laptops next year from Microsoft Windows uh, right. laptops will be will be doing touch of some si some sort using Windows 8. And nobody reads anymore until until Apple came out with the iPad and right. suddenly people started right. reading. And nobody wants to watch movies on a on a small device, et cetera, et cetera, right. et cetera. <laughs> Uh, I didn't. I was unimpressed, underwhelmed by newsstand. I have to say, uh, on the iPhone especially, where there's a dearth of uh, stuff. I, I in felt like stand. it was just like I. I it's I a went, folder. Well, it's a, you're stuck with a folder. Well, but I subscribed to something, and then I just ended up with an app. Right. And I was like, well, I don't understand <laughs> right. why. Why didn't it's I just go to the app a folder? Store? Yeah. <laughs> like I didn't. I was like, I don't understand. I mean, I got the Economist now. I'm very excited. Well, it's Economist working. Book. Condé Nast says that weekly digital subscription sales of its titles are 268 percent up since the newsstand came out. 268 percent from what from zero <laughs> <laughs> well now condi is the new yorker uh wired. it's vanity fair it's wired. wired it's all the magazine frankly it's the it's all the pre prestige magazines you see on newsstand they they kind of dominate um except for the economist the economist my favorite magazine and you have now you, uh, how does it work with the economist do you have a subscription yeah it's a subscription it's a digital subscription. Yeah. So you just get, and, and what's cool about The Economist is all the articles, it'll read them to you. And it's not a oh. computer reading them to you. It is a, a human. oftentimes a, uh, a British very human. nice sounding woman wow. uh, reading them to you, which is. Does she call you Alex? It, Alex? She does not call me Alex. But, Did but you it, know? It is very, it's, I have to say that it's, it's a very nice way to get the world news. I tell you though, when you look at newsstand on the iPhone, there's no, there's very, there's New York Times and it's downhill from there. You know, there's a BMX <laughs> magazine. Good housekeeping. Not a lot of content on the iPhone. You yeah. The iPad is much better. Yeah. Uh, better experience, though, too, I think. For, well, yeah. Consuming that content. Yeah. All right. I'll give you that. Anyway, it's uh, they're doing all right with it. It is, by the way, I, I should point out, it is the store. When you, when you tap on the newsstand button and go to store, it's the app store. So, in fact, if you do a... This is one of the things Sarah and I were talking on iPad <laughs> today... Uh, a wonderful show, by the way. We do at 1.30 p.m., 4.30 Pacific. 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern every Thursday on Twit. Um, that the store you're being pulled to is actually the App Store. It's just the newsstand section of the App Store. And if you do a search, you can't just search for magazines. It'll search for everything, not just magazines. There's no way to search for magazines in right. the newsstand search, which is really stupid. It'd be great if it worked more like iBooks, I think, where it kind of flips around. I, love the, I can't remember if that now jumps to the Do you, the do you download store. anything on iBooks? I did the uh, jobs biographies. The only thing. I, I, me too. <laughs> I, you know, my, my I bought thing, the physical book and then bought. Yeah, the, I, I got thought I should buy it on this. I got excited about the iBooks, but I can never find any of the books that I want, so I end up just buying them on Kindle. They're better than they were. I think yeah. that they've. You should look again. They've okay. added titles. All right. Um, it's a nice experience. The iBooks uh, experience is very nice on the, uh, uh, even on the iPhone, but really on the iPad, it's spectacular. But it's very legible. It's very easy to read. Mm -hmm. uh, the page turn is very. Uh, what is it? Skewmorphic. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, let me see. I'm just uh, you. You asked an interesting question. If I if I go to the store on this, does it pull me to the to a special store? No. Um, yes. yes. That's a bookstore only. See, because I know because the browse has a pair of glasses. <laughs> so it's yeah. So I don't know why it's not the same. Why does way? It do that? Almost yeah. with the newsstand, it seems like they should stick with that sort yes. of morphic thing where I can swipe through, almost like I'm looking at a physical newsstand. Right. right. You know. Just change it to kind of a steel New York newsstandy kind of 
interface and let yeah. me browse through the available magazines. Newsstand is a, it feels like an afterthought. It feels like it's a, it's a special folder and that's it. Well, yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's home screen placement, right? This is like what people used to pay for Windows. Right. It and, ain't on and my home screen. I moved up. No, 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 but end. I mean, you know, they, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's why we're frustrated by it as geeks, right? right? So you can't but delete it's the, it? You it's can't. the same mentality. Yeah, you can't delete it. You can't remove it. So you'd buy a PC and you'd have this stuff on the desktop, right, that you couldn't get rid of that was sort of pre-installed. And these were all deals where they made money, right? But it sold software, whether you wanted it or not, or sold services. You know, that's why AOL wanted their icon on the, on the desktop, right? Same thing here with the magazines, I think. And that's what we're seeing. It works. Yep from a consumer perspective, but, you know, geeks and nerds and tech people, we don't want it. You know, I want my old folder back. <laughs> Macworld is not going to be called Macworld anymore. June, uh, sorry, January 26, 2012, uh, Macworld Expo will now be called Macworld iWorld, the ultimate iFan event. I barf. <laughs> but I think that it's probably because, well, I don't know. Is it uh, trademark issues? I think the, the the majority of people who use it's Apple iPod products event. don't use Macs. It's an iPod I think the, mm -hmm. well, I think yeah. if you yeah, walk in, if you walk in if you've walked into Macworld, it's, it's all it really is much more iWorld than it is Macworld. Yeah. I mean, it's that there's you know, there's a couple of booths that are still Mac Mac, but there's mostly just iPods and iPads. Interesting. Well, and I, I think they're doing the thing that we all thought they probably should do when uh, Apple pulled out and make it more about the community and the people in the community and, and what's going on with that. So they're expanding, they're kind of changing the sessions and making it more about, you know, music and movies. I know they're doing a, a sort of movie thing right. there. And I think they're expanding it to, to reflect sort of what's going on in the community, which, it, you know, it could go either way. It could be a hugely successful thing or I think they're experimenting but it's probably the right thing to do because it, it puts the focus back on the user and uh, the community. We have questions at our uh, Pixel Core feedback loop site. We're going to get to those in just a second. Mike Elgin is here from Elgin.com uh, from MacCast, Adam Christensen the premier Macintosh podcast and uh, Alex Lindsay from Pixel Core, and uh, we will get to your questions in just a moment. As soon as I tell you all about Audible.com, uh, where is where is uh, where is Andy when we need him? Actually, there's no question what the Audible book, book recommendation is today. Actually, I don't even need Andy for this one. If you go to Audible.com/slash/MacBreak, you can get a book free right now. You'll be signing up for the Gold account. That's a book a month. These are you know, you know, Dvorak was giving me a hard time. I said I'm reading the uh, the Jobs biography. And he said, you're not reading it, you're listening to it. I said, well, every word is in there, I'm reading it. <laughs> no, you're not reading it, you're listening to it. Well, I am listening to it, and it's a great book. Great book, 25 hours, and it's, you know, I've, I'm fat, I've gotten a farther ahead in this book than anybody I know because I listen in the car, I listen at uh, the gym, I listen in bed at night, I listen all the time because that's the beauty of Audible books. You listen on it's, your iPhone, iPod, uh, iPad. It's the great way to fill up stupid time. Yeah. You know, like, so now it's no longer, it makes stupid time, smart time. Chat room saying also <laughs> that I'm not reading it, I'm listening to it. You I know, I, 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 got, I disagree with that, that the opinion that, that, that listening isn't reading. I mean, literature has been stories, uh, spoken stories since the beginning of time. And books are pretty recent. You know, uni the universal availability of books is a pretty recent phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's all about the stories and the content and the information. It's not ink and wood pulp. Mike, Mikey Fly's got the right angle on this. He says, well, that's fine. It's better than reading. It's audibling. I think the text is a fad. <laughs> it's a fad. It's text thing. <laughs> it's I, like I, sitting around the fire with was, Walter Isaacson as he it, tells you about Steve It Josh. was only here as, until we had the proper technology to put it back in its place, which is the, the fireplace. Steve Jobs, uh, the book is out now on Audible. You can get it absolutely free, all, and it'll play on anything, including your computer. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash MacBreak. So if you've been wanting this book, listen free, audible.com slash MacBreak. I mean, I think that's the best come on of all. We've been talking about it. Now you can listen to it. There are other great books. In fact, other great Steve Jobs books, lots of business books, but there's also thrillers, classics, mysteries, um, it's just fantastic. 75,000 plus titles. Audible.com slash MacBreak. Give it a try today. All right. Our Pixel Core feedback server is fired up.
and so are our fans. And, 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 and by the way, this, this top question was also when I said, what, what should we be thinking about when I Twittered it out yesterday? This was the biggest story as far as everybody, everybody so, was concerned. So what you're saying is we buried the lead. We buried the lead, which is the <laughs> demise of the Mac Pro. Will a possible, I don't believe it. The, so the rumors are that, uh, that the Mac Pro... Uh, here's, here's the rumor. The rumor is not so much that the Mac Pro is, is gone, but, the, that, but there, there is discussions going on at Apple about whether they should put out another release. And... And I, and, and I will say that I, I believe that, and this one, by the way, is from Peter James. Uh, thank you for putting that question in. The, I, uh, I think that we were probably looking at the last Mac. If we get another Mac Pro, we're looking at one more. And I really think Apple should do the right thing, which is to put out one more Mac Pro, upgraded <laughs> processors with a, with a Thunderbolt <clears throat> connection so that the rest of us can mm-hmm. go for another two or three years until they figure out whatever they're going to do. Um, you know, really, just one, just, <clears throat> just one more. And then I think that they need to... Um, Open source OS 10. If they're going to move away from it, they should just. That would be the ultimate kick in the teeth to the PC industry. Is that we will take your 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 uh, tablet industry, and then we will let everybody wow. use OS 10. <laughs> wow, that's it. Now you've been pushing for that for a long time, but that's a very interesting because it, it would strategy. It, it would be it would be the crush of it would because you're you're basically <coughs> open sourced OS 10. Now th- I think we won't see this until Xcode is running on iOS. So if you got to a point where Xcode was running on iOS and Apple didn't need I O, you know. You know, OS 10. I think the next step would be to. You know, open this is it. this is the first time I've actually given any credence to this thing you've been pushing for a long time now. <laughs> Years now. Years now. But this actually, this point, it makes business sense. Right. When you've made your transition to iOS, and that's as it almost is now. You're, you know, it's certainly a, it's the majority of Apple Apple revenue, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's close to it. If it's not, um, you still need the trucks. But why do you need to sell the trucks? Now, I, th- well, I think right, right the now, one thing I'd credit on this rumor is they probably don't need to redesign the Pro. No, 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 no. They just need to upgrade the processor. They can do that all easily with the existing <laughs> system. And put, and put a Thunderbolt in. That's the only, Thunderbolt part, the only thing that they need to do. is uh, th- That would be ha- fine. The and, Pro and, is a perfect computer. You don't need to do anything more to it. And here's the thing. As a Pro user, which I am, and as you someone don't care. who's attached... Well, the thing is, is I want Apple to open source OS X. Right. I do not want Apple to run OS X because they suck at it. Right. So the thing is, is that they... You know, you know, we, as a pro user, we never get what we need. We never get the graphics processors we need. Everything is dumbed down. So Apple, focus on that. And then basically, uh, otherwise... It doesn't I'm, say they're going to kill the iMac, though. I mean, they still sell laptops. They still sell iMacs. I, I, I think that all of that's going to be iOS. So the thing is, is that, but I think that, you know, no. I think that's the long-term development process of Apple. I don't think, I don't think Apple's interested in this, but uh, if they're that's not, interesting. there's a transition and I don't think it's going to happen immediately, but I think over a couple of years, but I think Apple should open source it at some point because then we, the truck, we drivers, need to rename this show to iBreak Weekly. <laughs> well, yeah, not yet. <laughs> so I cast. Well, this, this came up when we were at, at the MCE when I was up there in Petaluma earlier in the month and, uh, you know, I think um, it was Jason Snell who kind of defended this because I, I thought, oh, this is crazy. You know, Apple's not going to stop making uh, pro machines. But the, the key seems to be in that conversation, we thought the Thunderbolt connector. I think Alex right. is right. You know, with Thunderbolt, you can have this breakout box. You can have this thing that can be added to an iMac or a MacBook Pro. And suddenly you get advantages of portability. Plus, when you're back at the desktop, you have the power of these big power for graphics cards. You can expansion off there you can put more drives in there you can put raids in there i mean it, the possibilities become infinite so i mean one theory is that the mac pro goes away but it's kind of replaced by this more modular kind of system yeah. using well, at this point, as the foundation what is the difference between an imac and a mac pro it's oh, purely expandability right no 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 the mac pros are still performing high our yeah, mac pros are still processors. performing considerably better we but, that, can also but put in- is there any reason you couldn't put those same processors in an imac I don't think so. The only reason they don't do it right now is they're artificially making this well, distinction between pro and consumer products. But I, but I think that the issue is, I think if Apple put out one more, one, more, um, one more Mac Pro, a lot of us keep our Mac Pros around for a while because they are expandable, because we can switch things out. Um, you know, if they put out one more with a Thunderbolt connection and, a, you know, and, the, and the faster processors... And just leave it at that. Well, no, no. By then, I could see you having an iMac that had the same power that we needed and so on and so forth two years from now. But, but it doesn't exist right now. We're barely seeing any Thunderbolt pieces. And, and as I said, uh, for those of you in the chat room, I'm not saying that Apple sucks at doing I, OS X in general. I'm saying from a pro user's perspective, the iOS solution... I mean, I'm sorry, the, the OS X solution is horrible. You know, the, you know, it's 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 better than the other options, but it is you know an open source version of this, um, possibly managed, you know, or something, would be far better for a for a pro user. 
um, than uh, than a. So I'm only speaking from the pro unit. The pro next big jump in Intel processors is Ivy Bridge. That's spring of next year. Okay. That's on, a on, go ahead. Sorry, on the processor side, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but on the no, processor no, side, a question, a really good question came up today. Um, I was talking to John Martellaro at uh, Mac Observer. And the question was OpenCL. There was all this promise behind OpenCL and leveraging the right. GPUs right. that are in these systems to beef up the processor. And when you look at some of the numbers that were run back then, I mean, it's amazing what they could do. I think they were achieving things like he said, you know, a teraflop and where 800 gigaflops were coming off of the, the GPU. Um, so I'm just, I don't know what's been happening on that side of, oh, of one of the things, big, and that could go a long way to changing the, you know, the landscape of the pro Mac. My, 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 my uh, from what I understand, one of the big problems is, is that because, uh, because OpenGL is so used in the actual interface, in actual OS X, the issue that you get into is that Apple wants to write all the drivers for it. NVIDIA tends to no, want I mean, to write open, all open its own drivers. CL. I know, but I'm saying that the problem oh, is, is that the support for all of the the open all of those things are are intertwined. It's you know it's a different it's called something different for Nvidia, but the point is right. is that is that um, uh, all of those things are intertwined, and so Apple wants to own it. These the uh, um, you know Nvidia wants to own it. I, I don't know about ATI. The, the the issue is is that we really want the, the the graphics manufacturers to to write their drivers. You know that's what they do. You know that's what they do for the Quadra cards. And that's how you're going to get the most performance out of those cards when you're up. And when I say pro user, I'm really speaking to pro, you know, high end users, the guys that really need big machines, um, 3D and, and heavy duty. Because I don't even know if you need a high end machine anymore to, to, to just do editing. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, we use uh, IMAX for most of our editing and it's just fine. Um, but I think that for the really high end, where you know, the place where I think these machines make a difference, um, I think we really, we, we would love to get something a little bit more open well so that's what you're saying on the software side this is why you'd like to see it opened up because that seems to be where maybe the bottleneck if they're going to let this go if they're going to let it go and if they're, they're going to stop developing these let it let it go so alienware can put os 10 on their machines you know i still and, think that that's just uh, against the culture and I, I, yeah. I, I think it's not i think it's against the culture right now but i think that once apple doesn't need Could it change that's just like dropping a little uh, match change. into the brush. It make a lot of people happy. Yeah, <laughs> you get to the other side and, and go. Okay, now we're just going to light the rest of this on fire. Yeah, there's a business. <laughs> there's a business uh, advantage, I think you could say. Yeah, and it's the kind of out of the box thing that Apple is famous for. Uh, but they they're not notorious for loving open anything. Well, I th it, after they don't need it. Yeah, give it away. Yeah. yeah. Um, interesting. We'll just have to wait and see. What, is there another? So the, the next. Do the, we have a consensus? Are they going to drop the Mac Pro? No, we don't have a consensus. We don't, we don't know. We're, we're making our, uh, our case that they need to do one more. I, I think they, I mean, at the very minimal, I think they can drop it down to maybe one system. Are they at one system now? I can't basically. remember how many configurations. Almost one. They're right? basically yeah, one. But with I, I think Alex is right. Maybe one more revision. And then I think they rethink sort of how these, how these things go together. Think about I, what I they did with Final Cut. It go. Think yeah. about what they did with Final Cut. Uh, isn't that what they did with Final Cut? By, they, they, they eliminated the high-end user. Well, and they I, moved towards the mid-range. I think they definitely they they refocused uh, Final Cut towards the the mass of the of the people who are using who are, who need to do editing in the next five years, which is folks that are a little less um, uh, you know just less trained you know to do this stuff, um, but have great creative ideas and so on and so forth. One I have thing to say, I'm using I use a little bit of everything. I'm using a little bit of Avid, Premiere, Final Cut Seven, mm -hmm. and Final Cut Ten. On the things that Final Cut Ten run on, it is just wow. One thing, one thing Apple did learn from the Cube, which is that the pros don't care about design in the least. The Cube was just aimed at a pro right. who wasn't going to pay extra for that fancy design. And uh, the pro is fine. It does the job. It's a tower case. I wish it was rack mountable. They killed the rack mount. They killed the extra. I wish it was right? the same size. Just I think they're size. moving in that direction. I don't think they'll kill the pro. I just don't think they'll bother to update the design. Yeah. They'll continue right. to put new motherboards in it, new cores in it. When the uh, Ivy Bridge comes out, they'll be Ivy Bridge. That's, by the way, when they'll put a, a mini, uh, whatever it is, the port in there, Thunderbolt. Um, well, and, then, and then they'll keep that for a few years. I mean, there's a market. If they could still sell it. The only question is how many they're selling and whether that's an important part in them, of the market, right?
Well, I, well, I, but just, I, I think that there's more than that. I think that the support of the pro market is it, one of the issues is I think that Apple sits on, if they choose to continue to develop it, sits on a perfectly vertical market, which is that everything when it comes to content, everything from the creation to the, to the final viewing. They're a viewing, consumer company now. But, but it's, it all mm -hmm. sits on it. And they, they have, um, uh, they have a, a vertical market that they built between producers and consumers um, that makes Krupp's arms look like a walk in the park. I agree. And that's the business. But I think that they need to keep that business. I don't think that they should give that away. I don't think they have to. And the pro is, is, is where it all well, it's starts. A, it's, it's at the very beginning From of the, the developer's creation process. point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? The next one, they all fall off after the second one, which is where's iTunes match? Well, that's obvious, yes. That's the other big question. It was supposed to come out at the end of October. <laughs> I believe, if I'm correct, it's the beginning of November. It is it, today. Today. It's, it's officially late. Today. What happened? I want it. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Uh, this is the deal where you pay 25 bucks and they upgrade all of your stolen music to high-quality DRM-free AACs. They put it in the iCloud, but you can download it, right? I mean, it's not, it's not, you're not, you don't have to always have an iCloud. Okay. Yeah. They let you sign up, but you can't use it. You can right? sign up now? I think you can sign up. I think you've been able to sign up for a little bit now, but you, you don't get anything. It doesn't do nothing. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I wonder about with all of this uh, business is, you know, uh, Siri, as we know, uh, sometimes tells you, I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave. Right. I can't reach it the can't, server. Can't keep up. Yep. And so there, there's a capacity issue with their with their servers. Now, Apple has in recent years been radically expanding their data center capabilities. But I wonder if this is another data center issue. They're just not ready. I think it's more likely it's some kind of legal wrangling issue with trying to the, the keep company? the record, record companies in in uh, where in do line. I where do I sign up for that? Not in iCloud, I see. I think on uh, iOS five you can turn it on now. My biggest fear I mean, they may have turned it back off. I don't know. They're they're flip flopping on it. I don't think there's a, I don't, it can't be contractual at this point. It must be a technical issue. It's got to be. I hope not. I hope that the, the reality oh. distortion field didn't go, go away that quickly. Mm, yeah, I don't see any uh, music match. I see iCloud backup. I uh, see... Maybe I'm totally mistaken. Yeah. I apologize. <sighs> Siri, where is... <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be quick. Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> Siri, where is... Well, I didn't finish you, nitwit. Siri, where is iTunes match? Searching the web for Siri, where is iTunes Mac? Yeah, so am I, Siri. Oh, I shouldn't say Siri, right? I don't know why. Do, I, do you do that too, Mike? I always say Siri. I shouldn't say Siri. I, I sometimes uh, thank, uh, thank Siri. Thank you, Siri. Yeah, thank you, Siri. And then you get a nice, you know, you're welcome type. <laughs> All right. It does, Siri doesn't know either. <laughs> Siri, check the data server down the hall. Yeah, never mind. All right, we're going to uh, do our picks of the week, and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, Twit photos coming up. Catherine Hall has the week off, but the great Derek story is already in position, ready to begin talking about photography in just a little bit. So excited. Uh, let's start with you, Adam Christensen. Your pick. Oh, do we want to do the iOS tips and the uh, Lion tips? Do you, sure. Do you have a tip? I have a tip. All right. I have a tip. Andy's not here, so we could... Uh, the uh, so the tip of the week and, and dispense with his lion let me, tip. Let me, uh, <laughs> I put it in the notes and then I uh, summarily forgot about it. So um, so my tip of the week is uh, this is this has to do with tabs um, and this was actually in in Safari iOS. Um, yes, in Safari iOS. I know what your tip's going to be. So I like this I, tip. I put it in the in the rundown actually. Um, so and I and I think I've you been, can get recent uh, recently closed recently, tabs. Yes, recently closed tabs and um, and so what you can do here is. Uh, you can, if you hold down the plus, so if you go to your Safari and hold down the plus, you will see the things that you closed. So if you closed it too quickly and you want to go back to what you had been tabbing, um, it is a great uh, way to uh, find that last thing. And I want to thank the, the person who uh, submitted I can't do this it on, to my Twitter feed. I don't feed think is, I can do it on an iPhone. I, I don't you can't have do it tabs. on the iPhone. Yeah, you, it's you only, it. you it's only it. iOS. Here, give me your iOS and I can show people. So here, here's, this is on the iPad. So, you know, when you have tabs, he only has one tab open, but there's always this extra show another tab. If you click and hold the plus, there's the tabs he's closed recently. 
And, and one that of, is a nice feature. And one of the things with the iOS uh, features is there's so many people using this. I've, I've been kind of crowdsourcing these. And so I put it up on my, the day before. I put it up on my Twitter feed like, hey, what's the hot iOS tip? And people started <laughs> submitting some of them. And this was from Mike Johansson in you, Mike. Uh, Skelef, Skeleftia, Sweden. Wow. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I'm going to keep on doing that because I'm, I'm learning a lot about iOS because there's a lot of good ones that I haven't said yet. But people are sending in great ideas better than I could think of myself. Neat. Uh, let's see. I don't have, I was thinking if I had a lion tip lying around, um, but I, I don't. Uh, so let's go to our pick of the week, starting with Mr. Adam Maccast Christensen. And yeah, sorry, just to clarify on the iTunes match thing, you can turn it on is, is the thing, is you go into the music app and the little... Oh, it's in the music there. app. Oh, okay. It's in the music app settings. Ah. You go to settings, music, and I believe the toggle switch is on the top oh, for everybody. thank you. But then it just says coming soon. Right. You know? Hey, but at least <laughs> it's on now. Can't that's do the, anything with it. That's what matters. There. It's on. <laughs> Um, so my pick actually is somewhat related to me reading the uh, Steve Jobs book because there's a ton of great just quotes and, and information oh, yes, in there. And I've yes. had this app for a while. I hadn't really leveraged it. Do you remember uh, Matthew Bischoff? Yes. Uh, one of the first uh, teen podcasters. He's the guy uh, who told me about podcasting. He is now writing apps and he has an app called Quotebook that lets you grab and store quotes and you can oh, tag neat. them you can put ratings on them you can share them on sms and facebook and twitter um has full search in there you can add you know the credit where the quote, quote came from source um and it has a cool thing where it, when you're doing copy and paste on the ios device it'll recognize you have a quote on the clipboard and automatically turn that into a quote so when you're moving back and forth using the uh the switching uh it works really great about my only complaint about it right now is the only way to get quotes between devices is you have to do an import export thing. But they even make that easy because you can email a, a comma separated value or text file uh, between devices and, and transfer them that way. But I'm hoping there'll be Dropbox or some sort of integration in the future. Don't really know, but it's a it's a great little app for keeping track of all your quotes. And I always want stuff for like when I have to do a presentation or something like that, something to throw in. And this is a great, great place to just store them uh, right on your iOS device. So I'm finding it incredibly useful now that uh, I'm reading the Steve Jobs book. Very good. Quotebookapp.com. Quotebook. And Matt, that's so nice to see that Matthew's doing so well. He's in college now, I think. Is he at, uh, I saw some pictures, but I can't remember where he is, but somewhere nice. Uh, do you have a pick, Mr. Alex Lindsay? I've got a couple related ones. Okay. So um, my first pick is, uh, uh, Mac, uh, I, we use a lot of uh, Cinema 4D from Maxon. It's maxon.net. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And um, they have a new version that they, they released a couple weeks ago called uh, R13, it's just R13, you know, of, of, of Cinema 4D. And uh, if you're thinking about 3D, if you're thinking about getting into it, uh, to do high-end kind of work, uh, this is probably the easiest, fastest way to get going on it. And, they just, and, and what they've added is really good. You know, this is kind of more inside baseball, but really good motion blur and uh, what's called a physical camera, which uh, allows you to get some really great imagery out of it. And uh, I just love the the um, the new pieces, uh, some physics. It's a lot of fun. So the thing is, is that if, even if you're not sure if you're ever going to get into 3D, they have a 30-day demo, demo. Just download it and play with it. Uh, it is, it's just a lot of fun to play with 3D. And this is probably the easiest one uh, of all the, uh, of the, of the big five uh, or so um, uh, 3D apps to actually um, do something with. Now, if you don't want to spend that kind of money or you don't, you're not ready to down, pull the big download, I've got something for your iPad called Forger. 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 Um, this is uh, F-O-R-G-E-R. And uh, a lot of us have heard of, you know, stuff like uh, ZBrush and uh, some Ooh, of the other ones. So I check like this, this out. Yeah, this is this, this is looks like Kai's Power Goo kind of. Yeah, so. Wait a minute, you got to show it over here. So, hand, okay. you, you want to do it or shall I? You can, you can just... Can, here, can I'll get you, my head out of the way. Go can ahead. You, or, can you see it? Or, yeah. Or, okay, yeah. so I, I, have, I was just playing with this. So, so I can take two fingers and I can rotate around. Let me just move it over. There we go. So I can move, I can rotate around here. Of course, I can, um, you know, zoom in and out. But what is that? Okay, so what I can do is I can actually, Ooh. I'm just sculpting. Now, it's very hard to do this <laughs> under the camera <laughs> while I'm stretched across. But the bottom line is, is there's a whole bunch of little tools. And if you go down here, uh, there's different kinds of tools here that oh, you can so use. Neat. And this is really written by someone who does a lot of this stuff. So there's just a lot of really great, um, <coughs> you know, things that you can get in here. So let's see what this one does. This one kind of, inf you know, inflates. So you can, you can do little, you know, lots of little sculpting. If, and I, can, I think if I hold this down and go like this, I can make the brush bigger. 
I've just started to learn how to use it, but it is so much fun to sit there sculpting away. And I made a big mess, but you can, there's, you know, there's a lot of better things. And you can start, you don't have to start with a sphere. Can you, can you save those models? What you can save them, you can export them. There's import, you can import files and work on them there. And I believe there's an export, uh, there's a way to get them out here, but I'm not, I haven't tried to do that yet. And there's a little tutorials on That's how to That's very Escher, what you just did there. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, um, anyway, it's $2.99. Oh, that is neat. $2.99. Really uh, if you, yeah, if, 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 it's just. It's called Forger. It's easy. Easy to F-O-R-G-E-R. Really yeah. That is really, for three bucks. Yeah, three bucks. Wow. Yeah. That is really and, and it, cool. Here's the thing is that you should just get it just to see uh, how much uh, you can do in 3D on an iPad. I mean, it's just, it just really cracks into, it performs really, really well. It's a lot of fun. I want to buy that. Yeah. This is, by the way, something I love on Android. I wish they would have on iOS. You know, on Android, you can go on the web to, ins you can install from the web. You go on the web to the marketplace, say, I want this app, press it, and it will send it to your phone. And your phone, just next time you pick it up, is installed. Now, now I, I have See, to I would love that right now. I would like to put Forger on my, on my iPad, and I would just want to do it right here. I don't know. I've been buying stuff now with iCloud, and it just shows up on all, all oh, little so devices. And so I've been, you know. It, that's just, a good point. It does show up. Yeah, yeah, it just pops up. But I still have to do it on you, iOS you, you device. I want to do it on my laptop. I think you can do it on your laptop. Could I? Yeah, I think you just have to turn on iOS syncing. Kaneko gave me a, a lion tip that is probably uh, what we call on the iPad Today show a duh tip. You guys all know this already, but it's been driving me crazy. You know, when you're looking at your purchased store uh, apps in the App Store, there's always stuff that you wish, you, you know, you just don't want to show up. Like Snow Leopard's Xcode. I don't need that anymore. I'm on Lion. I didn't know this, but, you know, when you hover over it, see that Xbox? Boom, you're never going to see that again. <laughs> just be careful when you yeah, do that. Yeah, well, I don't know. There may be a way to get that back. But there are programs that I bought or installed at one time that I know just don't want to see in here anymore. And that's how you get rid of them. Just there's a, When you hover it over the thing, there's a little X. Did you guys know that? I did not know that. See, I didn't know that. And I, yeah, it's been driving me crazy because I have this long list. And you can't sort it. You can't, you know, this list is a pain in the doohickey because you just, this is it, right? All the things I've ever bought. And that's just only going to get longer. What's it going to look like in three years? Oh, it'll be open source by then. It won't matter. Uh, do you, Mike, do you have a pick, a, a topic, uh, anything you'd like to share with all of us? I sure do. I have uh, an awesome pick. Uh, it's called the Allo Clip. Uh, so if you go to bitemyapple.co, <laughs> you'll see the $68 uh, lens for your iPhone 4S or iPhone oh, 4. I want to do this. Yeah. yeah, and what this does is it gives you a fisheye, a wide angle, and a macro lens in a tiny little clip-on lens device that fits in your it fits easily in your pocket oh i do want this yeah that's this was B a kickstarter is that, uh, B, uh, how do you spell that i can't find it b-i-t-e yeah m-y apple.co b-i-t-e m-y apple.co yeah all right and here we now, go now it gives you a 10x multiplier for the macro lens <sighs> which is awesome and also gives you a fisheye lens and a wide angle lens do you have so, any images on your um google plus account that we could see using that uh, I don't. Um, I posted a thing about this, but I haven't seen uh, the images on it. And I personally haven't bought one yet, but I can assure you order, I will. I'm going to order it right now. Yeah. And uh, if you, I guess their website has some uh, has some images you can yeah, see. Did they sell on. the glyph? Or did they? They didn't make the glyph. Are they? Are they a reseller? I have this was a this was a Kickstarter project, and they uh, say that they're going to have a new shipment coming in a few days. So uh, sounds like it's really happening. Uh, are they the same guys that made the glyph? I don't know. Oh, because the glyph maybe they sell the glyph because you need the glyph if you want to do a macro shot. Probably you want a tripod. The glyph is a tripod that goes into a clip. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's neat. Good for them. It's awesome. I'm I'm ordering it right now. The glyph is coming. Yeah. Too. Yeah, and I'm I'm ordering. Now, do you what is it a magnet or is it glued on? It's a. It, I think it's a. I think it's like a clip. A clips on. Clips as on, far as right. I can tell. That's how it should be. Slides over the corner. I slides think. over the uh, corner. Uh, yeah. Everything breaks cases, though, doesn't it? That's too bad. Yeah. 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 Oh, very good. That's a nice uh, pick. Yeah. Mike Elgin is mostly on Google, but uh, Google Plus. But the best thing to do is just go to Elgin e a e l g a n dot com, and you'll find his Google Plus account. And uh, follow it there. Subscribe to his newsletter, too, because that's an aggregate of all his Google Plus postings. Please circle me. Circle me, he says. It's the new, the new thing. All the kids are doing it. It's good to have you, Mike. Always a pleasure. Good to be here. Appreciate Thanks it. for having me. Yes. MacCast is still the longest-running Mac podcast out there. Yeah. Yep, coming up on seven years. Unbelievable. Amazing. A record. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> 
M-A-C-C-A-S-T.com. This is the guy who hosted Adam Christensen. Uh, you can yeah, follow I also him. Need to yep, sorry. I also need to give a plug because I always forget for my iOS podcast that I do called We Have Communicators. Oh, I don't see it. We have communicators.com. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, we have. I like that name. It's very few people do because I always forget to mention it's it. It's whimsical. <laughs> it's whimsical. We have. Well, it used to. Yeah, it used to be the iPhone Alley podcast, but uh, that got sold, and and we got a new name, and I came up with We Have Communicators. So, we have communicators dot com. You've done 141 episodes. My God, man. You're yeah, right. we need we need a site designer though. I think. Well, I think there's a lot to be said for it. Just like content. <laughs> Boom, 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 boom. You could have a different yeah. image every uh, show, but other than that, I think you're set. <laughs> hey, Adam, so good to have you. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you again. Thanks. Alex Lindsay is at pixelcore.com. Pixelcore.com slash live for their live broadcast on Thursday. What will what you be talking about? Brent Bias coming in. Yay. Sharing some Brent goodness. Brent's the guy who does all the lighting and cameras here in the studio. He's just amazing. Yeah. He is an expert on lighting. He's a, he's a gaffer's gaffer. He's, he's awesome. Yeah, you know, he's just, it's just so much fun. We have so much fun having him on the show. So we're going to be doing that at 6 p.m. Uh, and again, you can ask questions. Uh, you can watch. You can, you know, have a, have a great time. We do it every week. Um, this, one, this one is uh, uh, dealing with mostly video production. Uh, sometimes we do effects, uh, uh, photography. So just come. It's uh, Thursdays at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And if you want to know more about Pixel Core, the great guild of multimedia artists who learn and work together, pixelcore.com com is the website pixelcore.tv for their podcast and, and I'm, thre I'm threatening to do a tweet up oh in vegas next week you're gonna be in vegas next week all next week. so am i are you are we both in vegas i next am week? speaking to we is it webmaster world yeah i'm speaking on tuesday in vegas i'm gonna be there on tuesday ah, in vegas. Dong. what are you doing live, there i'm doing a live stream from wednesday to friday but we're, we're for salesforce or for salesforce yeah huh so uh so anyway so the um uh so yeah we're there i'm there all week so we'll have to Maybe, maybe we should just do a, a big tweet-up. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. Well, uh, and, if, and if you're going to be at, uh, uh, I guess they, uh, they call it PubCon, make sure you come. Uh, I'll be speaking uh, November, Tuesday, I think is November 9th, I believe. One week from today. Is that right? Yes. So who's going to host Mac, Mac Break Weekly next week? I, I, I think Andy's oh, on the boy. <laughs> I'll try and figure that out. We had Andy. that conversation quite some time ago. November 8th, we'll both be out hey, of you town. Know, we, should, we could just do it in Vegas. <laughs> we should just do it in Vegas. Yeah, we, we're both there. You know what? That is a possibility. Let's I could, talk I could, about I could, it. I could probably peel out. I'm, try, I'm flying back right after the talk, so uh, I don't know. When, I'll have to look at when my flights are. Okay. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, PubCon Las Vegas. I will be giving a talk on... Uh, um, what, I, what marketing means to me, because I'm kind of the anti-marketer. So, you know, it's a big marketing right. event. And uh, I'm just going to talk about building community without advertising in any way, shape, or form. That's not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I remember correctly, there were three advertisers on this show alone. No, no, yeah. I didn't mean not advertising on the show. You're doing your own advert. I don't advertise right. our shows, right? I don't have billboards on the strip or anything. Right. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Can I make a quick plug? <laughs> and Miss... Eileen Rivera, the star of All About Android. I don't know what you could possibly plug well, on, a, on a Mac show. I know, right? Well, I would like to plug our uh, twit.tv slash best of site. Oh, that's so that you can plug. actually uh, tell me your favorite Mac Break Weekly um, story moment of this year. Yeah, we're going to do our best of again for the holidays as we did last year and the year before where we take the best moments from the year and put them together as a show so we don't have to be here on Christmas week. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. So it's it's twit.tv slash best of. Yes. And then we have a very special forum. There's a forum and then there's a drop down here for all of our shows. I don't think all of our shows are going to have best ofs, but Colin went ahead and added You know what? I don't think, case. I think it's fine. We want to know if there was anything good in any of these yeah. shows that would be useful. <laughs> So here's Mac Break Weekly. Something you could uh, tell us. Thank you. There was nothing happened. All right. One I want to have one last uh, vote before we end this show. When we convene next time, let's pretend it's next week. <laughs> Will iTunes Match be out yet? I say yes. Will it be out by next week, Adam Christensen? I'm going to go with yes. Boy, two yeses. Uh, Mike Elgin. I'm going to say no. I'm with you, Mike. <laughs> no way. Split decision. Christmas 2012. <laughs> now, after, after that, after that, you have to say bye bye. <laughs> I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for joining us. Get back to work. Break time is over. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>